So good evening, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you to our event tonight on programming computational processes here at NYT School of Architecture and Design. I first want to thank Dean Maria Perbellini for her support to this event, the NYIT School of Architecture and Design, and the speakers, and all of you for attending this event tonight. The event is part of the Spring 2019 Lecture Series and Public Events titled Fast Forward, Forward Making Mediums that speculates on the agency of mediums as a broad range of working methods, both as a physical matter and modality of communication. I also want to thank the lecture and exhibition committee for their support. This event is also supported by the visualization sequence coordinators, myself, Dustin White, Pavlina Vardulaki, and John Bermudez, and Spring 2019 Visualization faculty. And also, this event is connected to another event on April 17, Automation in Design Symposium, organized by Dustin White and Pavlina Vardulaki. The event tonight is set up as a roundtable discussion with a series of short presentation sessions from the speakers that will be followed by a roundtable discussion on the theme of computation in design, framed through the lens of the work presented to reflect on the current and future impact of computation within the discipline of architecture and design. We would like the roundtable to be an opportunity to also engage the audience in the question and discussion. Before my introduction to the event, I would like to invite Assistant Dean for Academic Operations, Anthony Caradonna, to the podium for the welcome remarks. Thank you, Marcella. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here this evening, and everybody involved with uh, organizing this very exciting evening. And on behalf, <laughs> on behalf of uh, Dean Maria Perbellini and the NYATS School of Architecture and Design, I welcome all the esteemed students, faculty, guests in our audience, and our distinguished invited presenters and professors, Naomi Frangos, Pablo Lorenzo Eroa, Christian Pongratz, Tom Varebis, Pavlina Vardulaki, and of course, moderator Marcella Del Signore. I also wish to thank again <clears throat> Our Dean Maria Parbellini, and on behalf of the SOID for sponsoring tonight's event, as she's serving at another commitment this evening. So tonight's presentations and conversation focus on computational processes which are fundamentally based in algorithms. Algorithms are deeply intertwined in our everyday lives, from ATM machines and, of course, computer applications, to social engineering, medical prognoses, and crime prevention, to name only a few. The concept of algorithm has existed for centuries. Greek mathematicians used algorithms in, for example, the Euclidean algorithm for finding the great common divisor of two numbers. The word algorithm itself derives from the name of the ninth century mathematician, astronomer, geographer, and scholar in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. His name was Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, whose name means the native of Khorazm a region that was part of greater Iran and is now Uzbekistan later, uh, Uzbekistan. Later his name was Latinized into Algorithmi. Al-Khwarizmi was the most widely read mathematician in Europe and in, in the Middle Ages around 825 CE, primarily through one of his books, The Algebra, which itself is derived from an Arabic word meaning completion or reunion of broken parts. This published treatise led to the first systematized study of algebra and advances in geometry and trigonometry. As brilliant as Al-Khwarizmi was, he could never have imagined his impact on, 21st century, on our 21st century lives, on the evolution of architecture and design, and how his obscured legacy inspires the questions and work our panel will be presenting this evening. So please join me in welcoming Professor Marcello del Signore again and our distinguished group of architects and presenters. So before we start, so I will start with a quick introduction about the event. Uh, I forgot to ask you to please turn off your phones uh, as we continue with the event tonight. Um, so the event tonight 
and programming computational processes will expand on practices of computation in design research, framed through the lens of processes, constructed knowledge, and analog digital computational thinking. The speakers will engage through their presentations areas such as representation, digital fabrication, material intelligence, generative and parametric design, and emergent urbanism to reflect on the current and future role of computation in design and how it's transforming architectural research and practices. I would like to introduce the event by asking, how does computation as the application and development of novel ideas and techniques in computing enter the domain of architecture and design? How do computational processes inform design? How do they inform different types of processes? In very simple terms, computation refers to the mathematical relationships and calculation to define the act of what is called computing, referring directly to what we call algorithm as a procedure generated by a set of rules to perform a task. Since early 90s, CAD and CAM, so computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing processes, have expanded the modes in which designers work from the physical to the digital, engaging first processes of pure repetition of tasks in design and production to the expansion of to compute ability, allowing designers to embrace a larger field of possibilities. With the introduction of parametric software and processes based on algorithm thinking, this allowed to encode parameters and rules to define design scenarios. As a consequence, protocols were established between design and physical production, information and matter. As the two fields continue to be more and more integrated towards a design continuum governed by feedback loops we witness the emergence of a new design culture that integrates computation, production, material intelligence, responsive system, coded information, and much more. At the same time, design framed through computation is challenged by the negotiation of top-down and bottom-up processes, while indeterminacy enters the field of design as a category. But while we witness more and more levels of indeterminacy, we also witness the, the presence of translated materiality back into physical space. Architectural design research centered around computation has begun to over-embrace and possibly feel dependent upon the production of artifacts and environments that are predictable, precise, optimized, and repeatable. In contrast, we witness a shift towards the embracing of uncertainty as a productive design tool, where processes, materials, tool, materials and tools, production methodology are contest, constantly recalibrated, potentially allowing for the emergence of an alternate modes of design and production. The continuous tension between predictability and unpredictability, precision versus imprecision, Certainty versus uncertainty allows for the emergence of design that reposition our vantage point towards recalibrated computational processes and imprecise mode of production. The 2018 Acadia Association in Computer Aid Design Conference, where I served as a technical chair and editor of the conference proceeding, expanded on these themes that we're going to discuss tonight and reflected on the expanded theme of recalibration in computational processes. So the event tonight is a vehicle to explore forms of programmed versus unprogrammed computational processes through design manifested both as an algorithm construct, but also as analog forms of computational thinking and making. Through the presentation, we will see a range of projects, approaches, and scales to again reflect on how computation informs design and how design is informed by computation through the lens of processes that manifest through multi-scalar form of design. So we have an amazing group of speakers tonight. Uh, Tom Beribes, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor, NYITSOAD, will present Urbanism, Transdisciplinary Indeterminacy, 
Naomi Frango, associate professor, NYITS OAD, will present material codes of an analog mind. Pavlina Vardulaki, visiting professor, NYITS OAD, will present design morphine. Christian Pongratz, Interim Dean, School of Interdisciplinary Studies and Education, NYIT School of Interdisciplinary Studies and Education, will present bits and atoms. Pablo Lorenzo Roa, Associate Professor, NYIT SOAD, will present unprogramming design information. With this, I look forward to open the event this evening uh, with the presentation sessions, and this will be followed by a roundtable discussion where we hope to engage all of you. Uh, so thank you once again for being here tonight, and I would like to uh, start introducing the first speaker, Tom Berebes. Tom Berebes is the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor in the School of Architecture and Design at NYIT, School of Architecture and Design. He's the Director of, of his practice, Ocean CN Limited and was co-founder of Ocean in 1995. His former academic roles include Associate Dean for Teaching and Learning, 2011-2014, Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong, 2009-2016, co-director of the Digital Research Lab at the Architecture Association in London, where he taught from 96 to 2009 and most recently as the founding provost of Turnerscape Academy, 2016-2008. Verebes was guest professor at Academie der Bildenden Kunste ABK Stuttgart, 2004-2006, and he has held visiting professor roles at U University of Pennsylvania, Rancelier Polytechnic Institute, Syracuse University, RMIT, Singapore, SUTD, Uni and University of Tokyo. He had directed AA visiting school programs, including the AA Shanghai Summer School for 12 consecutive years, from 2007 to 2018. Among over 150 publications, he has published Master Planning the Adaptive City, Computational Urbanism in the 21st Century, Routledge 2013, a guest edited issue of AD titled Mass Customized Cities, Wiley 2015, Shanghai Tenfolio, Oro, 2017, and DRLX, a design research compendium, AA Publications, 2008. Verebe's work has been invited, exhibited in over 50 venues worldwide, and he has lectured extensively in Asia, Europe, North America, Australia, Africa, and Middle East. Please join me in welcoming Tom Verebe's. Thank you, Marcella, for uh, your introduction. I think it's eaten up into my 10 minutes. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and thank you for organizing this wonderful event. Um, let me see if I can project. And um, right. uh, I think titles often need a little bit of explanation. And as I looked at all the titles, I was waiting for everybody else's explanation. Uh, so maybe I should um, do that. I I'll be talking about two things. Uh, urban isms uh, and transdisciplinary indeterminacy. Just briefly, uh, the notion of paradigms that guide ways of thinking and practicing about the city, um, the ideologies and the, uh, and the tools associated to those uh, guiding ideologies. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, transdisciplinary indeterminacy, which is a kind of uh, inflated way of uh, uh, describing a kind of multidisciplinarity of uh, my practice. So I'm going to talk about practice in sort of two senses. One which is uh, a more professional practice and as a consultancy and uh, supported in a sense uh, of examples by a series of student projects uh, in some of these schools. One way of thinking about practice is looking at um, a timeline of um, of projects. These are a selection of urban projects, whatever the threshold of that means, uh, not architectural uh, so much. But interestingly here, it's the what I would think, I'm going to move away from the microphone, uh, whether there's a pointer, is this timeline of software and certain moments that are kind of key in the practice in terms of uh, email allowing a uh, distributed form of practice, Wi-Fi allowing us to move across uh, our own offices in a dis distributed sense. 
Um, that might just foreground talking about three projects primarily. Uh, and I'll describe what these projects are uh, in a moment. Uh, one is a master planning project, one is an urban design project, and one is a landscape urbanism project. And we'll get to those in a moment. Uh, a way of looking at those and thinking through them more in terms of the kind of methodologies that kind of work through the projects. Um, one can say that they're computational processes, but I think they have to do with, I don't know if you can read from the back, uh, graphic spaces, pattern and geometry, optioneering versions and variations, of looking at uh, ways of describing uh, difference and slight iteration across the kind of series. Uh, intelligence, intelligent modeling of learning and feedback, being able to use those variations to kind of feed back. And then a series of qualities from aggregation, orientation, degrees of legibility, growth, heterogeneity, generated specificities, scales and size, and density. So across these three projects, it's possible to uh, track the operations um, of the methodologies and the particular co kinds of processes and their spatial um, material organizational effects, that of the um, qualities. Just to maybe respond a little bit more directly to the questions or the dialectics that are set up as, as uh, Marcella presented, some of those in, in more prose form, um, and the abstract that we were all sent uh, and that was published had some of these um, uh, dualities. So rather than seeing them as uh, un or im or un uh, each um, uh, condition or, 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 or uh, uh, what I'd rather do is in my own work uh, see these as antonyms or opposites that aren't reliant, re reliant upon a kind of negative uh, and I think that they'll relate in terms of top down and bottom up processes and effects um, permanence and ephemerality and planning and emergence through some of these projects. So the, the urbanisms that I'll describe um, are maybe ways of thinking and naming and, and organizing uh, our thoughts, actions, and uh, ways of interacting with the city. And if one thinks through a sort of 100-year trajectory from uh, Patrick Geddes and the cities of evolution, the first moment where the city is understood as a kind of uh, transitory changing kind of organization to the megalopolis uh, by Jean Gottman, Global City by um, Saskia Assassins, the network city or mega cities um, uh, coined by Manuel Castells, and Rem Koolhaas's project on the city, which when he proposed this um, uh, uh, research center at Harvard University some 20 years ago, he wanted to call it uh, the center for the study of what used to be called the city. So it seems that one has to almost rename the city to study it. Uh, and Rem, in some 20 years earlier, in Delirious New York, um, writes that a new balance between control and decontrol, uh, in which the city can be at, one, at the same time uh, ordered and fluid, and a metropolis of rigid chaos in Delirious New York. So the Manhattan grid, I think, in some sense, in a computational world uh, and ways of working, uh, is constantly found within the kind of bounding volume, and I think this is how we've worked in our projects on urbanism. Uh, and this was a workshop at the University of Calgary where 24 students produced uh, 10 urbanisms, and so we had uh, uh, 240 uh, models done in four days. So four, uh, four urbanisms, not four days. Uh, in my work, that's um, been framed uh, in a sequence in time as parametric urbanism, the adaptive city, mass customized cities, uh, and intelligent urbanism. It sounds like a more intelligent way to say the smart city, which has not yet been co-opted by architects nor urbanists. Um, these are really four short stories about Hong Kong, but that's a whole other lecture. Um, I would say that there are examples that one can take of each of these in their historical eras. Uh, the first, um, uh, this was a, a, a research agenda worked on at the Design Research Lab at the AA uh, from 2001, uh, to, sorry, 2005 um, to 2009. Uh, and this project from 2007 uh, focuses in a way on the kind of tooling of parametric design and applying it at a much larger scale than what was understood in, in, in say, those that, that era uh, towards a 
a project about urbanism, but really a very large-scale architectural kind of uh, set of effects. Um, the adaptive city understood in a, a master plan project in Hebei province uh, as thinking through all of the constraints that will enable growth and change or of a particular adaptivity to quite local instances, that of a, a river, a canal, existing roads, etc. So um, the adaptivity spatially but also in time. The, um, uh, the, the notion that a city can be customized or that the, um, how architecture participates in the specificity and distinctness of urbanism uh, was um, uh, theorized very much through a project for an invited competition in Osaka. And as a last example um, of intelligent urbanism, uh, uh, an invited competition for a park, uh, an urban park in Shenzhen, um, looking at um, a range of systems that would read the landscape, the sentience of a topography of the, um, uh, of the urban edge, uh, and the kind of routing systems and the various programmatic distributions that sort of find their position and their form. So these four urbanisms, have, uh, I've also written about them from AD articles and other sort of um, publications sort of uh, long ago on parametric urbanism to the adaptive city or master planning the adaptive city uh, and the AD, uh, all of which that was in the intro. I think in a, in a sense these are um, uh, uh, ways of interacting with paradigms through particular kinds of processes uh, that I think have real programmatic um, agendas associated to them. Not programmatic in the sense of activities and uses, but programmatic in the sense of uh, political agendas, particular approaches to the city, which will always be quite political. Um, and as this series of posters for AA summer school programs in Shanghai, um, the, the naming of them, interesting, interestingly, is tracked kind of almost parallel to uh, some of those publications or the taxonomy of these urbanisms from evolutionary urbanism, the adaptive city, urban formation, uh, customized cities, uh, specificities, and city smart over a series of six years. So the, the smart city, up until maybe about a year or two ago, and the, maybe the discrediting of social media um, has not so much to do with the, the bottom up or the democratic and self-organization, and that of the big corporations. Of course, these on the bottom are also very large corporations. But it's this struggle between the bottom up and the top down, um, uh, between safety and security and comfort as kind of agendas that sort of are masked uh, within um, the uh, agendas and, and goals of um, the technology companies that want to install these sorts of systems and the civic governments. So that's maybe a, uh, there's a lot of detail that one can go into on that. So four urbanisms. Um, these are effectively uh, four different uh, scalar types uh, responding to the notion of multi-scalar design in these processes in, in the abstract. So with master planning, um, understanding the, the, the grid of, of a city as potentially distributing a, a series of programs, the atomization of color, uh, the reading of that, uh, and then the deploying of uh, constraints within which one can deploy. This is one of those grid bays uh, being worked on through a series of consta constraints that effectively uh, program uh, not just uses, but uh, heights and densities and footprints uh, and landscape spaces. Um, in, in a studio at RMIT, uh, uh, working with uh, recursive uh, patterns, um, a project for Qianhai in Shenzhen, in which uh, the multiplicity of two very different systems uh, clash and even collage together uh, are worked across uh, a larger master plan. Uh, second, uh, not so much urbanism, but the disciplinary category of urban design. If one thinks through a kind of strategic uh, objective of, of this proposal was to develop a kind of manifold of possible scenarios and configurations uh, which were adapted uh, to diverging organizations of uh, future investment models, planning considerations. Uh, and these are six zoning scenarios that play out with uh, programmatic ratios, the, the dials up there, 
and a relationship between open space as what kinds of open space, whether it's public, private, uh, and ratios thereof. And this is, I think, really where the design is, um, the back-end computation. This is a series of diagrams overlaid of uh, what informs these sorts of models uh, is um, the more back-end computation and, and the description of what's happening with uh, these positions, attractors, and orientations. And as a, as a master planning project, this was at, at UPenn as a as student work. Um, the, um, well, called same, same, but different. Of course, this is five student groups of students working together, rat producing a kind of radical juxtaposition of uh, five different projects, um, kind of quite promiscuous and even postmodern in, in its kind of um, uh, aggregation of uh, difference. Uh, in the same project, the, the, in the same studio, uh, one of the projects and the, uh, the relationship between, say, the, the more master planning scale and, a, and an architectural scale in which structure, infrastructure, landscape, uh, and architectural systems are fused. So landscape urbanism. Uh, the tools and techniques uh, of landscape urbanism cross between ecology and infrastructure, uh, generally uh, speaking. Um, and this project uh, seeks to look at um, the landscape, in effect, as a kind of set of infrastructural systems uh, and a, a range of uh, patterns that kind of play out across the landscape that uh, get materialized as pathways, material systems, landscape systems, um, building and architectural systems. Um, and a student thesis project at Hong Kong U, which uh, reads the sentience of uh, the landscape um, and plays those out in terms of reading topography and existing infrastructures, existing buildings, uh, and uh, uh, redeploys them in terms of uh, a, a shrinking city, so in terms of uh, an understanding of adaptivity, not so much to growth and, and, and addition, but uh, recession and uh, the, the repurposing uh, of uh, green landscapes and agricultural land and recreational space to new kinds of industries and, the, and their architecture, uh, and new routes of circulation and, and other forms of infrastructure. And lastly, uh, architecture, um, and the processes that go into thinking through various building systems. Uh, in this project, uh, uh, a project which is invested into um, the, the curve in the linearity of three-dimensional space in a kind of deep sense. Uh, yet the tectonics are all about flatness and straight lines, uh, just in the sense of, of making the architecture. And in terms of programming, um, uh, the, uh, a project for the legacy of the Tokyo 2020 um, stadium. Uh, of course, the biggest problem of an of a Olympic stadium is its legacy in terms of being useful and programming it thereafter after the two-week event. Uh, and so the brief for this project was, in fact, to program a stadium in, in a way that it would be uh, functional for a long time after. So I, I think that there's there's a there's there's a there's a there's a few provocations about uh, programming in terms of disciplinary categories, but also um, in a sense of uh, the application uh, of uh, of computational processes. I was, I was seriously considering only showing this slide, so if I can have another two minutes, I'll, I'm sort of, I think, at 10 minutes now. Um, I really wanted to only show this slide, but I thought it would just either be too annoying for my colleagues and uninformative for students. Um, uh, on the middle, uh, the middle book by Charles, all three are by Charles Jenks, the covers, uh, was the first book my work was published in as a student at the AA. Uh, and I really thought for 20 years earlier, uh, as a grad student, so 20 year or so years earlier, uh, I entered first year of architecture school. And this book, The Language of Postmodern Architecture, was something that I certainly and my whole cohort resisted vehemently. Um, and I gave Charles a lot of space uh, in when it was uh, 1995 when he published uh, Architecture of the Jumping Universe. And interestingly, uh, in 
2011, he publishes the story of postmodernism, subtitled Five Decades of the Ironic, Iconic, and Critical in Architecture. And he takes the Manhattan grid, or the Leon Creer-like um, grid, uh, and populates it with um, effectively what we would think of as digital projects. Um, and the, the deep postmodernity that Charles thinks about the work of today um, was once again really troubling to me. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to sort of talk about this much more in depth, but I do agree with him to a certain extent about the, the, the promiscuity uh, of our contemporary forms of practice, um, the ways in which they, they sort of are um, um, able to be conceived of as, as divergent and, and uh, lacking consolidation. I'm quite excited about the, the proliferation of difference within uh, uh, cultures that we talk about. I, I think those that bemoan the convergence and sameness uh, should talk more to Charles Jenks. Uh, so maybe we can talk about some of those, um, uh, some of that, uh, some of the politics, the promiscuity, and uh, the, the the programming of uh, of difference. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. So next speaker, Naomi Frangos, artist, educator, architect, and founder of her own practice, Naomi Frangos, engages an interdisciplinary analytical approach in the creative process, driven by technopoiesis aspect of critical making. Her current research focuses on variable, modular, and interscalar systems of design and fabrication, blending analog and digital modalities, tools and processes informed by material experiments in metal, concrete, and ceramics. For over two decades, she was lead design project architect in Europe, the US, and Canada for internationally renewed award-winning firms and recipients of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Gold Medal, Canadian Architect Award of Excellence, Quebec Grand Prize in Design, International Architecture Award awarded by the Chicago Ateneo Museum of Architecture and Design, and Milan 16 Metra Award. OAQ Award of Excellence, Fair the Interior Design Award, and nominated for the Miss Crown Hall of American Prize. Her work has been exhibited in the US and Canadian galleries at Fish House, Florban, Castella, Salon B, and McGill University. Her craft theories and creative work published in Canadian Architect, the Journal of Architectural Education, Architects Newspaper, and Ceramics, Art and Perception. Her research projects were awarded institutional research creation and design build grants and presented at the national and international conference and symposiums. She holds a post-professional master in history and theory of architecture and bachelor's in architecture from McGill University was awarded Provost Graduate Fellowship and NSERC Scholarship and obtained a professional diploma in welding metalworking from Montreal's trade school. She previously held teaching appointments at McGill University of Montreal, University of Quebec, Tyler School of Art, and Temple University, and is currently NYIT Associate Professor and Lecture and Exhibition Coordinators. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Frangos to the podium.
Hello, thank you, Marcella, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, open up with, as Professor Tom Veriba suggested, to talk a little bit about the title, and then I have some projects to show through a, a series for my presentation. So the title is uh, called Material Codes of an Analog Mind, and I make reference to um, the verb list compilation actions that relate to oneself, material, and process, published in 1967 and 68 by artist and sculptor Richard Serra, where he included 84 action words and 24 contexts, considering not only operations on matter, but how final forms and installations could operate to engage the experience of the human body and sight that requires the functions of spatial and perceptual cognition non-existent in software computation. Sarah's infinitive form of the verb, uh, for example, to roll, to crease, to fold, prioritizes the projected action of becoming and implies an engaged act, the idea of doing something without association to a finite moment in the past, present, or future, leaving the subject-object relationship undefined, opening up site and material as space. Where Sarah considered space as material, algorithms do not consider the non-object field. This series of work examines material codes in analog computation and design thinking that grows out of a particular material property, hand as index for material manipulation, and acts or processes that generate unprogrammed outcomes that resist the input of a finite sequence of instructions from software. Agency of the computational analog mind forecasts design informed by algorithmic studies of this kind of space and matter. So the first two projects uh, use a bio-inspired systems of growth, movement, and generations, and the last three consider modular seriality and deal with material and structural intuition, including weight of material. One, of paper to fold. This is a project entitled Superflat that I produced in a team with um, Ajax, Garcia, Vivian Wong, and Daryl, Darren Shin at the AA uh, Visiting School in New York in 2014. And um, it was an embedded intelligence workshop that employed biomimicry. Uh, it employs parametric design that's merged with biomimicry, revealing nature as a fragile yet strong, scientifically systematic yet phenomenal, and adaptive to external forces and internal structures. The outcome ended up being a suspended paper canopy that is optically activated reflecting light onto itself and shadow on the adjacent surfaces of an environment non-pre-programmed in its position in space or morphology. So the workflow engaged natural systems to material manipulations. The natural systems looked at um, biaxial bending of insects' legs uh, that, that do not rotate completely but that bend in certain directions. and. Um, the flower that uh, opens and closes from morning to night that looks at those systems that respond to um, the natural environment that they're in. Um, at the bottom, you could see the series of mat material manipulations that we had gone through and um, to come up with some kind of component design. and through the arrangement of one repetitive component that you see in the middle bottom of a fixed hexagonal geometry and a varying parameter double jointed system that is within the component and between the components, they lock the position of the angular degree of each component and the depth folds and offers an infinite span to create an overall tensegral structure and a global morphology that can be altered depending on the position of each individual lock. Um, this was a post-material study of the embedded intelligence software using Grasshopper and plugins for um, using Karamba and um, other, other uh, structural software that we use to calculate the principal stresses and locate the anchor points for a particular uh, moments of how, where the suspension should go. And you could see the series of generations that were made from the software considering our component and our locking system and the stress, um, the stress patterns that are indicated in the bottom right. But the precision from the laser cut flat components and joints um, is evident in the imprecision from the maker's hand in the assembly, um, activated through the act of folding 
And the interrelational forces that are both mechanical and structural, including friction and gravity, and the limits of the paper rigidity allowing for the nuances in the morphology. Number two, of clay to cast. Casting is no longer a process of replication. This project uh, was my master's thesis project um, in the history theory program, believe it or not. And it's entitled Fig Machine. It is um, highly inspired by Wolfgang von Goethe's scientific understanding of dynamic archetypes. And in his treatise on botany, he focused much more on the transformation and evolution rather than on fixed forms and species, as you could see on the top row there. How the fig works, or the, the fig tree works, is that it create it has two there are two species of fig trees and the fig wasp goes from one tree to the other and one one tree is only made for um, collecting the pollen out of these these receptacles and then it, it climbs out uh, the, it's actually a female fig it climbs out and it flies and it knows exactly which other species of tree to go and pollinate. Um, the, the flower thinking that it's pollinating the flower but dies inside and becomes part of the fig, which we end up eating. Um, so these, this symbiotic relationship and metamorphic states in nature highly influenced the way that I thought about creating this vessel for eating and drinking fig tea. And I did so um, using uh, these construction drawings, as you could see, that are extremely precise and rectilinear uh, for considering they're supposed to be for blown glass elements and slip cast clay. And they have all been calculated to include shrinkages of material. Now those shrinkages can only be calculated through the testing of um, certain parts in the kiln, the clay body, et cetera. So it becomes very, very much material driven. Although without the construction drawings, you wouldn't be able to start to create the molds. So these are the um, uh, molds that were made out of a series of wooden structures. And the wooden structures were cast in plaster and clay. And the goal was to create um, a series of geometric transformations of the circle into cylinders, ellipses, conics, and cones, and using uh, partial molds or using a combination of molds. So the computation uh, was very analog, um, yet the drawings were very precise. And um, uh, the cast elements that you see here are now into their final form. And all the pieces fit inside one another. And um, they're all made for uh, this ritual that we had to create for drinking uh, or eating, which for me it was the fig, uh, reminiscent of my Greek heritage. Uh, so here I'm just going to show you a quick example. This is, the, this is the ritual here that you can see of how it goes from a horizontal to vertical position. And I'm going to play you a very small portion of this video, which shows it in action. And um, partially because uh, when we create these artifacts, uh, often enough, we're playing around with computation, and we don't really know what we're going to come up with, sort of like the paper uh, tensegrity structure that I showed earlier. Whereas here, it was intended to have a programmatic use, yet the way that it's it, it comes out is not exactly perfect. Um, we don't know exactly how long to infuse the, the figs, for example, the dried figs, which are in that med medium vessel. And um, you could see that it does change Speaking color. Flowers, and flowers people are, are eating them. And then uh, when you infuse it a little bit longer, you open up the vessel, and you can actually serve the tea and in these cups that are embedded inside the, the vessel. Uh, that contain the dry figs. So um, let me just see if I can get it. To it's a cone inside a cylinder that was created with two molds, and you flip it around, and you're able to um, drink your tea infusion. Um, number three. Um, the number three is of steel to bend, and uh, this is uh, these are hand sketches that compute different configurations and consider various conditions of joinery of um, one single material section, a half inch steel rod, um, and think about the parts to whole and the programmed interaction across scales. 
Uh, it's called Apparatus City. It was highly inspired by the, the idea of a, a moving um, these modules within a, a rigid uh, structured grid and um, thinking about human interaction and the unpredictability or unprogrammed use of these spaces. The first, um, the first studies were done with bent piano wire. Uh, they're all the same length, they're modular, they're repetitive and commeasurable proportions, and the hand is actually generating aggregation through play. This is where they were intended to be used. This is the Ed Hall in Old Westbury campus for our uh, monolithic, uh, or colossal exhibitions for our NAB accreditation. And on the top left, you see the grid starts to transform from being a very tight weave to a loose weave. And so the, the idea of how do you situate these elements along this grid and unfold it um, was just a, a question of you know, where people were, what the context was, and what the materiality could do. So in this case, the context uh, was this corridor, and you can see that the module is repetitive and to create a, a tight weave. Um, this is the one that's in the gallery, and this was much more of a loose weave, and they, they, the, the dimensions range from 18 inches to 30 inches to 36 to seven and a half feet. So they, they go in ratios of one to two, two to 2.5, and one to two. Um, the precision um, is, is in the module dimensional stability, and then the imprecision is in the three-axis bending of the circular section, which causes a twist. As you could see, the grain and, and the, the, the way that the steel comes out of the kiln is never straight. So trying to put these modules together required um, a, to deal with imprecision and error, and so the soft cable tie was able to deal with this joinery. And that's it, finally installed. Um, number four is a fabric to stretch. And this is a woven material. The fabric has the potential to stretch in the three to eight X, Y, Z directions. Yet um, these steel members come back and they become reconfigurable mod modular framework and act as design agency to support the fab fabric to now start to generate cast forms that may optimize variability. The stretched texti textiles around the orthogonal coplanar members permit the fabric to find its own complex curvilinear surfaces through material intuition when loaded with mat wet matter. Um, one thing to note is that one side is loaded with sand, so it's a dynamic mold, and it could be manipulated manually to create the softer surfaces that you see, and the more wrinkled surfaces were the part that were not controlled. Number five of string to twist. This is the last project. Um, this was a project that used the, the enactment of the verb to twist and the idea of uh, Edward Moybridge's stop motion animation figure. So each one of those lines was a body, student's body being traced out in the action of twisting, which was translated into uh, small plaster casts with that act of twisting again. The, what was noted in the plaster cast was that the hole allowed for the twisting to occur. So number six of concrete to mold, uh, when we scaled up, we only changed one parameter and we, can, we did everything twisting of 90 degrees and allowed for the oval to descend um, across these 10 modules. Um, the material intuition is that the the, the material will f um, poured as a, it's poured as a column and used as a beam or used horizontally. And as you could see, those kinds of things cannot be drawn in this um, post, post diagrammatic drawing of the 10 modules and how the twist might happen. And um, the aggregational diagram or matrix of how these might be joined as well is not quite evident in how that might happen in real life, only considering um, very logical, rational ways of combining. Um, the unprogrammed use of space, uh, you could see people lying down and sitting and um, other activities that happen that are not necessarily always programmed into what is pre-considered in the design. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Next speaker, Pavlina Vardulaki. Pavlina is an architect and designer based in New York City and the co-founder and creative director of Design Morphine, 
and is responsible for making connection, creating ideas for new topics, and organizing and teaching workshops. She's also tutoring collaborations of Design Morphine with MIT and Harvard GSD. She's currently a visiting professor here at NYT School of Architecture and Design, and also creating a permanent installation in collaboration with the university. Pavlina was employed as an associate at LaGuardia Law Architects in New York, working on large-scale developments, ranging from master plans to mixed use and public project. She has also worked at Foster and Partners, or residential and mixed use high-rise buildings in Abu Dhabi. Pavlina has experience in interactive design projects from MIMA Forms, and her involvement as a consultant and Maya software tutor at the Architectural Association, DRL, in London. Her project, Hypercell, created by Pavlina and her team from the DRL, was exhibited at Acadia, the Foster Partners Graduate Show in London, the National Endowment for Science, Technology, and the Arts in London, UNESCO, 14 World Triennial of Architecture. In addition, she has participated in a number of design collaborations as a consultant of the ACMaster and Dubai Airport of the Future Hackathons, as well as one with Dubai Custom of the Future and as an intern for the Ferrari Design and AEA School of Architecture Vehicle Design collaboration uh, with Zadid Studio Workshop for Mar Parametric Urbanism and the Louis Vuitton and AEA School of Architecture Retail Design collaboration. Please join me in welcom welcoming Pavlina Bardulaki to the podium. Thank you, Marcella and NYA team for having me today. I'm going to start with an introduction. Uh, just one second, please. So um, thank you, Marcella, so much for uh, presenting me and for having me today. Um, uh, I'm uh, going to start, basically, I was going to start with an introduction. So these are just some photos of uh, my work in LaGuardia Law. And um, I was also a part of uh, Foster and Partner Studio 5, uh, working, um, uh, you might know Studio 5 uh, from Sheikh Zayed Museum and Mazdar City. Uh, I personally worked on a number of residential and mixed uh, use high rise building in Abu Dhabi, which are right now under construction, but I can't sh uh, show you anything right now. So, um, uh, I've worked also in interactive design projects, and um, I was a Maya software tutor in Architectural Association. Uh, and I want to share with you just a short video about Hypercell. So this is, um, let me just. So Hypercell is a project that we created under the Theodoros Spiropoulos studio with my colleagues at Mike Shokir, Josh Kuczynczyk, and Ho Juk Su. And uh, the, real, uh, the, the Design Research Lab is uh, treating design as a research uh, where we generate the code and create taxonomies and write the designs according to def different criteria. Uh, so we were working on self-assembly, autonomous systems where robots are programmed to perform and build architecture with a mind of their own, uh, just following encoded rules. Uh, so we were interested in developing a system that can respond to changes through self-awareness, mobility, reconfigurability. A time-based system that has no final form, but rather in continuous formation. So this is a project that I'm going to be um, going in depth um, on the 17th of April on the symposium on automation in design and design on automation. Um, so for today, I would like to start by introducing the concept of computational design, so we're all on the same page. Um, so the first uh, thing that I would like to start with, just Googling what is computational design, that's what you're going to come up with. So it's basically the application of computational strategies uh, to the design process. But the question here is, um, is it actually using the computer for design, a computational design? And of course, the answer here is no. 
And that's because in the beginning of the profession of architecture as we know it today, architects drew by hand with pencils and erasers, and each stroke of the pencil was informed by the need of documenting a design, but it was 100% depending on the designer to interpret and draw. As technology advanced and uh, drafting boards and pencils were replaced by computers, however, the process of design and documentation remained exactly the same. Only the medium changed. So the tools um, increased productivity and made design tasks more convenient to achieve, but in general, the practice of designing and drawing remained exactly the same. Uh, time frames in shortened, tasks did not change. So this is where we arrive to CAD, computation-aided design, which uh, essentially copies uh, existing physical design actions into the digital. The computer is treated as an aid to the designer rather than a contributing part of the design process. The past tools of the architects um, reinterpreted in their computer counterpart. Initially in design, computers were used for their memory and saving the process. You could do work with the ability to easily delete, erase, edit, and copy, reproduce, and save without having to start all, every time over and over again. And of course, the data in com uh, computers saved space and didn't degrade over time, like um, in paper. Over the years, computers started getting faster, and these speeds in processing capabilities gave birth to computational design, which is a new way of thinking. Uh, we, uh, we could program the computer to actually perform tasks for us rather than having to do every step manually. So this chart that you see here um, is of the most used cut commands and which commands are used most, uh, most re uh, mostly together. If we do all these commands and understand uh, the repetitive processes and patterns on how we use them, uh, how can we optimize the design workflow in a, in a way that lets us power, uh, the power of the computer truly help the design process? So here in this chart, you see the real difference between the CAD and the computational design processes. Uh, how we arrive to the beginning of computational design thinking, which is defining the parameters and rules of design, but having the computer's processor executed. This computational design, where design becomes a series of operations that can be adapted to multiple situations and conditions. So I'm starting with an extreme case here of the Sports Hall of Fame by Traharn Architects, where a computational structure system was defined and was able to adjust itself to change in the architectural form. The rules of the system create the structure, the designer creates the form, and sometimes the computation will restrict the form so that the structure can actually work. These steps prevent the designer from making mistakes as well as frees up much time for uh, mundane tasks and lay, uh, unless the architect think more about the big picture gestures. Um, in case uh, with many parameters, it's defined in the logic of a tower design based on factors and floor area of uh, an apartment allocation and views. So this is one project that I want to share with you. So basically, everything is uh, moving according to parameters that are set up from the beginning, and this is generating the form. It's 100% generative design. So um, this is a currently work in progress. It's another extreme case with many parameters defined in the logic of a floor plan based on room type, size, and proportion. So only with one click, you can see that um, uh, having the area that, uh, um, that, that we have, basically the, the computer generates all the possible variations of this plan. They developed the, um, so we have basically the, the 3D print and chair prototype from Zaharit Code and Stratasys. Mm. The video, unfortunately, it isn't, it's not playing. Uh, however, the idea here is that the uh, uh, CHA uh, code was developed in a custom workflow uh, with repeated interactions between design and structure analysis, and it also utilizes material saving pr uh, parameters developed by uh, Altair uh, technologies. 
so computational design, just to sum up, uh, basically enables you to create quickly without wasting hours on manual changes. Uh, you just change the data in the system. It lets you use data to inform design in a real mathematical way, not just theoretical. Uh, enables you to automate repetitive tasks that you might find yourself doing over and over and lets you prove uh, your design decisions with real data. And uh, last but not least, forces you to think of design in terms of uh, chunks of processes that can be used in many conditions. So um, I'll start now the second part of my lecture, which is about design morphing. Um, I'm a co-founder and creative director, and uh, my role is uh, to establish new connections and create ideas and uh, uh, for new topics and organize and teach workshops. Um, so uh, my opportunity to work with parametric design actually came through international workshops and this is actually the reason I co-founded co Design um, Morphing and I value it so deeply. I was studying Sofia Bulgaria and I was fascinated by the parametric world. Uh, but I had no access uh, to it through school. So I was interested to explore new design methods and uh, meet like-minded uh, designers. So I started going to different uh, workshops and collaborations, uh, as such as the AA and Louis Vuitton collaboration in Paris, ZHA and Coded Field. Um, and I also got invited um, to um, uh, as an intern, uh, have an internship with uh, the DRL and Ferrari. So these were actually very valuable experiences for me, and that's why uh, although I was still in school at the DRL, um, I, I, we did the, our first workshop. Uh, for now, until now, parametric and design, uh, basically parametric and generative design is what brings all the DM members together. And um, uh, design, morph design morphing is a creative hub for design basically through workshops, lectures, projects, and explorations in the field of architecture, design, and the arts. And in 2014, it was when we had our first successful workshops held in Sofia, Bulgaria. And this is, uh, has led already to the growth of the team and creation of new collaborations. And so far, we have had more than 50 workshops held worldwide in over 1,000 participants. Uh, the team is comprised for, uh, of uh, 30 talented architects and designers, along with many assistants and collaborating organizations, which gives us a multidisciplinary approach to design in its education across a gradient of applications. We also collaborate with schools and organizations like Harvard, GSD, MIT, IAC, Grimshaw, Union of the Architects in Bulgaria, and we co-organize workshops with our partners, like in the case of our visualization workshops with V-Ray. We also had the honor to be a keynote lecturer for the AAA New York Quad Conference in 2017. Uh, we like to think of design morphing as a universal entity, and we don't uh, have only one location or base. We travel in order to bring uh, our knowledge to a variety of places, uh, like um, Tel Aviv, Vienna, Amman, uh, Cairo, Skopje, Dubai. Um, so we are teaching a variety of software, uh, everything basically that is relevant to the design uh, community. So we're teaching Maya, ZBrush, Revit, um, Grasshopper, Keyshot, um, and uh, we're going into uh, Python processing, and uh, this summer we're going to introduce for the first time uh, Houdini. And uh, we also uh, work with uh, more than 15 topics um, which have to do not only with architecture but any kind of other design. So the skills that you learn here in school, they're not applicable only in the architectural field and the parametric design that makes that possible. So what we explore is basically jewelry design, fabr uh, fabrication, visualization, animation, machine learning, and BIM. So again, everything that uh, basically students are uh, eager to learn. So what distinguishes our workshops is that they surpass the teaching of technical skills and show a new type of theory and a way of thinking about architectural and design problems. So our uh, workshops provide an opportunity for international experience, meeting new people with similar uh, interests, and every participant while learning a new software develops a project, and that helps to apply new skills and tackle problems while having to the support of the tutors. At the end, everyone lives with a new project in their portfolio, and many of the students have been accepted to master's degree problem, uh, programs in Harvard, the Agnevanti, AA, SciArc, CETA, and so on, and even have been accepted to internships to work in ZHA, BA, Big Ideas, Fortune and Partners, and other reputable offices in the world. 
So um, here I'm just going to share some of the projects that we have done over the years. So this is a floating structure, which is a grasshopper workshop on generative design. All the designs that you see here are made in four to eight days, and uh, the students don't have previous uh, software experience. So um, these are some uh, Maya futuristic environments, so uh, guided by a futuristic scenario, basically. This is Mayan ZBrush and Grasshopper all together, uh, creating a glitch of the environment that they, uh, they're created. Um, this is uh, the workshop that we're having with V-Ray, and it's all about post-production and rendering. And we also create these workshop collaborations which uh, have to do with um, other firms. This is basically a pavilion for the Bau exhibition in Germany, so the students took part of a workshop and their uh, final outcome, final design was uh, picked uh, from a team to represent them. Uh, also, we have uh, many other workshops that have to do with uh, grasshopper and model making, ceiling structure in Athens, Revit and Dynamo stadiums, um, high-rise buildings in Jordan, architectural detailing with grasshopper, jewelry design, um, creating art with robotic arms, uh, and aerial robotics, basically uh, having quadcopters to collect data in order to be used for design purposes and machine learning processes. Um, actually, after this workshop, a lot of the students started their own startups on machine learning. Uh, so Grasshopper, um, what I, I want to say is that uh, we're having our first uh, webinar series, uh, which is starting this weekend. And the Grasshopper uh, Pufferfish um, uh, uh, webinar is for free. So you're more than welcome to join. So um, Michael Pryor, the design director, is actually a graduate of NYIT. So you're more than welcome to join. And uh, of course, if you're interested, you can um, follow us on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And also, we have our Dream Boost uh, scholarships coming up. We are having annual scholarships that we give to students uh, that we're going to announce shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Pavlina. Next speaker, Christian Pongratz. Christian Pongratz is interim dean at SAISI and professor of architecture and interdisciplinary studies at NYT, previously founding director of the digital design and fabrication program at TTU. He studied architecture at TUUM and SciArc, and is licensed architect in Berlin, Germany. He worked in New York for Peter Eisenman and John Remitz, and co-founded with Maria Perbellini, Pongratz Perbellini Architects, a research-oriented atelier investigating computation with material-based processes. Since 2003, they are collaborating with a pool of leading Italian stone companies, and in 2008, their hyperwave stone cladding product design received the mentioned Compasso d'Oro 19, awarded by the ADA Italy. Both are authors and designers of the monograph Peter Eisenman, C3, 1997, Natural Born CAD Designers, Birkhauser, 2000, Cyberstone, a book investigating digital design and fabrication with natural stone, Edi Stampa, 2009, Digital Media for Design textbook, Cognella Academic Publishing, 2015, and online digital design and fabrication 2015 and urban stage 2015. At the New York Institute of Technology, his interest is to foster collaboration via making among NYT's programs and departments and formulate new transdi transdisciplinary degree programs and projects, engaging broad environmental, social, and economic issues through the lens of design research, technology, and ultimately material. Please join me in welcoming Christian Pongratz. So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Marcella, for organizing this really exciting event. And I'm glad to be here and um, speak to so many students. Quick question up front. Um, 
who did ever use a floppy disk? Hands up. <laughs> All right, so now the students understand that. <laughs> and thanks to Pavlina, but she had an image before on her slideshow. So now, now the students know that the guys who, on, and, and ladies who are talking here, they are, they are really old. So um, my talk is, uh, that I bring to you today is, is about the fact that we are all kind of deeply involved uh, in questions of, or in the process, <coughs> to learn how bits actually move atoms, and why are many or with many forms of computation, which as you all understood by now is in essence kind of algorithmic processes. And so I think it's, uh, First of all, and, and in the end of all, really about bits to atoms. <clears throat> or maybe also how um, bits can become atoms, or maybe are atoms, right? as, as uh, maybe we will see later on. So how did we get here? The first thing we had to overcome was the digitization of communication. So we have done that. Then we went to the digitization of uh, com uh, no, communication first, then digitization of computation, and now we find ourselves in the digitization of fabrication. What does it mean if we look more in detail? So it's basically transistors, data, and materials. Yeah? Let's talk about transistors. We all have to remember that we are still living under Moore's law. It means that the number of transistors double every two years, and we reached by now about <coughs> 20 trillion transistors. So we arrived, I think, at a level of sufficient computation. We can really do anything. Data. We got about 50 billion IP-enabled sensors, and we got about 2.3 billion broadband phone connections by 2014. So the world's stock of data is doubling, actually, in size every year. How we will we use this enormous amount of data in design Let's look at materials. So just <laughs> in a more recent, basically, de uh, uh, development, uh, let's say additive material processing exponentially increased since 2012. So the steep curve that we see includes basically everything, in in including full 3D houses printed. Now, we don't know yet the kind of embodied energy of those various design mixes that we're all confronted with. And I want to maybe uh, pick two uh, particular areas that, <coughs> in a sense, as topics, which I would say are questions where you know everyone, or let's say in, in this case ourselves, we have to wonder how do we extrapolate knowledge, or kind of where do you really want to start digging? So one question could be subtractive processes. In this case, we pick, since a while, <laughs> natural stone, uh, just simply for many reasons, but one of them is really that natural stone has the lowest embodied energy. So it's a material that's really worth maybe uh, considering. And I picked one project, really an old one, it's from 2002, but it was for us really maybe, um, one of the first really big challenges to understand so how do I move now from the digital to the material. So in this case it was <coughs> a private client and he owned yeah, an an, an open sky quarry, and asked us, so how can we reuse that space, and how can we actually maybe enclose it in some form? And we as architects picked, of course, the most complex and difficult decision, and said, okay, maybe we employ a topological landscape, right? And maybe it's actually out of natural stone. So that led us then, of course, to the first problem, so how do you collect the data of the site? Yeah, we got a digital survey, and the digital survey basically gave us nothing but a cloud of points however, was describing a complex freeform surface. So then you're facing, okay, so now how do I move, how do I move at that time, <coughs> let's say the cloud of points through a series of software packages to make it actually, um, how to say, an adaptive, uh, usable uh, set of data. So we developed various types of uh, compound curved surface models uh, and, and, and phase and step by step basically integrated kind of different varying manufacturing content surface subdivision, uh, questions of material thicknesses, et cetera. 
even actually at the point to kind of really modeling individually each in, uh, individual 3D stone block. We moved then yeah, from Rhino to Maya to Katia, trying to find maybe a software that would just allow us to as, as closely align ourselves with the manufacturing industry. So then we ended up, let's say, with a 3D model, but then you have to think about the actual assembly. Yeah? So having modeled <laughs> the whole thing in 3D, I came up with the idea and said, okay, so now how do we mount actually stones, in this case for the operable portion of, of the surface, onto a steel structure? And I said, okay, if we have, would have some 3D fabrication keys, kind of long pins, that would actually um, identify the connection point between four uh, stone blocks, and then actually identify the space or the, the vertex point on the steel structure. So having done that, I realized, okay, you have it on your digital model, but you need it also on the physical model. So we had actually, <laughs> the only chance, we, it cost us a while of thinking, um, the only chance was to use actually a, a, a traditional GPS survey system, which then would actually take your cloud data of your digital model and pop it onto an existing steel structure with all its tolerances as it came from the factory and to identify then exactly the vertex points. So a lot of, um, I would say, uh, uh, trouble and, and fight, but we kind of um, went through and learned a lot. So in the second step, <coughs> then we said, okay, let's um, use some of the experience in a maybe less complex way. And it's instead of going down the road of compound curved surfaces, we did actually flat 3D relief panels for uh, uh, in, in stone as facade claddings for buildings with a potential customizable panelization and also various design options. Now, interesting about that here is, again, through the process of fabrication, what did we discover and learn? One aspect, for example, you have your design software, you got your data in there, and suddenly you have to deal with CAM software, real fabrication software. We went to s uh, different types of software packages and found through that actually modes of how the, the generated G code would allow us actually at one point to extrapolate particular layers of surface textures, which we see kind of on the different types of cuts of stones on the bottom, one way. <coughs> or another way, you go down to the tooling and you start to learn more about, so if I use different types of tools, different sizes, how do they actually impact the material? And then of course the question that we all have is, so how could actually my understanding of a tool, material properties, tool size, inform upstream actually my design decisions and inform me about timing, cost, and by that I actually design options. And then the other thing you learn is through the material properties, right, they condition you actually at one point how you design your 3D model. Because with stone at one point, I think the quest is how thin can you get stone? So here on the upper uh, right you see uh, Carrara stone and on the bottom the respective 3D model and the thinness of that had to be determined once you understood how thin can the stone really get so when the tool actually moves through the milling pass it doesn't really break the stone, right? And we had some breaks I have to admit. And the other thing I learned in that process was that my students at the marble, sc marble school in Verona, Italy uh, were very attentive and that the, the craft that they employ in a manual analog um, working on stone is really in times of old digital working actually an asset. And so we realized that kind of certain things of tooling processes, you can't really uh, yet do them or they're very costly. Right? And so actually, in this case, we got a pretty interesting um, collaboration and in fine-tuning our designs. Second part, besides fabrication, maybe talk a little bit about tools and maybe questions of, of robotic automation. Okay, we another diagram. We can confront and see that until well, approximately by 2025, we have a total market of $87 billion dollars in uh, related to robotic automation, which has, uh, is currently being revised constantly because of increasing consumer demands. So the future will mean for us as designers that we gotta have to have some kind of technological expertise, which means learning how do robots really work. 
And in that case here, understanding some questions. How, how many joints do I have? How do joints move? How do they rotate? And questions of singularity in robotic automation. It was my team in Texas, transdisciplinary, engineers, designers, <coughs> scientists, social scientists. <coughs> we even went as far of saying we're going to program the inverse kinematics process as a custom grasshopper script so actually we can drive our fan a robot. Which is this guy here. So then once you have your custom script, you want to actually test it. And so in this case, we used an ad hoc uh, robotic hardware cutting end effector to use uh, uh, tests on, on soft foam and actually realize um, if the script really works and not to have too much damage in the end. And at the bottom, maybe then a process of finishing in, in glass fiber reinforced plastic uh, process for making composites. Now the other thing I think that is really important is generally custom tooling. So once you're actually in the area of robotics, I think what is really interesting is, yeah, you actually at one point, you want to actually create your own end effectors depends which materials you want to work on and how you want to work on them, you might come up with kind of interesting ways. So here we went through uh, making our own custom concrete 3D printing end effector for a robotic arm. Um, as a robotic hot wire cutting, as I said, on the bottom is a kind of a multi-tool. So I had the idea, why don't we have several tools actually on the robotic arm? So just like Edward Scissorhands, you can just rotate the arm, you can different, do different things at the same time. right? So it's actually fun at the same time, but also maybe effective. Here at NYIT right now, um, I have uh, some robotic teams working in the innovation labs in, in, in uh, Old Westbury and in, in, in Manhattan. And we are collaborating <coughs> with a uh, company in Las Vegas, uh, Harrington Dynamics, who developed a custom, I would say, a robotic arm where we are framing right now a curriculum around it. It means teaching every student from whatever discipline they come how to build a robot, understand what a robot really is, learn about the language, and apply to whatever you really want to do, make really anything. So um, together with uh, students and faculty in osteopathic medicine, we're building a bioprinter. Uh, students uh, working on using the extruder uh, discovery for uh, experimenting with paste. We have a, a, a gripper. And down the road, we are thinking, oh, at one point, probably, the robot won't actually self-replicate itself. Right? And you are certainly all welcome to join the team and explore what it means, robotic automation. Brings me down now to the, <coughs> what is called the, fabric, uh, um, let's say, the 20-year roadmap as expressed by Neil Gershenfeld at, NY at uh, MIT. So on the one hand, we have to say computers make machines, or we are close actually machines make machines, depending on which kind of fabrication equipment you look like or you look at. Um, we are very close, as we saw before also in, in some of the presentations. Some of the codes make materials, and ultimately what will happen in the 20-year timeline, programs actually will be materials. Right? Looking back, actually, Louis Kahn, maybe for some kind of foresight, had a, uh, um, how to say, um, an expression uh, very much relative to that that actually really talks about, yeah, when we really study nature in the end as a designer, we excavate nature, right? Which brings us to a kind of a model of design that very likely we probably have to learn about computation, yes, but we have to couple it very tightly with questions of material science and also studies of artificial life models. That's probably where most of um, uh, the innovation parts um, in the near future will actually uh, happen. Where are we right now? Okay, we have uh, worldwide an increasing amount of makerspaces. Uh, interestingly, and I think um, positively, also in developing countries, which down the road we can hope empower the right people. I think um, under the umbrella of the open city paradigm, it's not only making. Uh, yeah, there's fabrication, it's very important, but also actually design thinking. That's really, I think, what we have to uh, employ on a more, much broader basis, non-domain specific, because we want to actually educate students 
yeah, to be the technologist, but also to be the generalist. So design thinking, starting with empathy in particular, and ending maybe some with implementation, is all about people. That's what we have to learn, is what students have to learn. How do we really deal with the needs of the people from every discipline? Only then we might be able, right, besides all the data that I showed before, scarcity is among us. Nobody answers and addresses it. And if we empower personal fabrication on a 20-year roadmap, possibly we can actually deal with, with the most imminent questions that are actually open today. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So next and last speaker tonight, uh, Pablo Lorenzo Eroa. Pablo Lorenzo Eroa is an architect and scholar in the field of architecture, urbanism, ecology, and computation. Currently an associate professor at NYT School of Architecture and Design and design principal of E. Eroa Architects. Lorenzo Eroa received his architecture degree from the University of Buenos Aires and Princeton University with a Fulbright and the National Endowment for the Arts Scholarship. Professor Lorenzo Eroa has been appointed at several universities, including the Cooper Union, UPenn, Columbia University, UIC Barcelona, Sapienza University Rome, and the University of Buenos Aires, where he was also invited to lecture on many occasions, including invited and keynote conference presentation at institutions globally. Mr. Lorenzo Roa published essays, presented and exhibited projects in different media and institutions including the Venice Biennale 13, 19, 24, and 26, MoMA, MAS Summit, NYC Media Lab, The New York Times, Construct, Yale, Pigeon, Princeton, The Generic Sublime, uh, Harvard Actar, and others. Lorenzo Roa has authored and co-edited five books, including Instalaciones Eisenman, DLO slash RE Buenos Aires 2008, and Architecture Information, Routledge, Taylor and Francis, London 2013. Please join me in welcoming Pablo Lorenzo Roa. Thank you, Marcella, for uh, the introduction and also for um, organizing this event. Uh, I think it's great that um, we share our work, but also what, what we have some time to discuss it. So um, I organized uh, my presentation uh, a little bit differently, uh, given the time constraint, but also the fact that there's going to be a second event uh, in which I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, the relation between computation and fabrication. In this case, I wanted to um, focus a little bit more on the problem of uh, computation relative to algorithms. The problem that uh, I have in general with uh, the relation with the problematic relationship between computation and architecture is uh, in relationship to design authorship. So for instance, we are used to um, design using the latest available technology. And most of the time, architects are simply just implementing the ranges of possibilities of these given technologies. In that sense, uh, the problematic relationship between predetermination and design, architectural design as, as a problem of non-determination, has not been addressed in relationship to the, uh, what has been happening since the modern movement. In other words, I think that uh, in the modern movement, it was very conscious, the problem of predetermination. And uh, after the Second World War, architects became very aware of the problem of non-determination. I think that we claim that we do architecture that is non-deterministic, whereas in reality, we are all confronted with uh, systems that are already set up in advance of the design. So in that sense, uh, what I would like to focus in this presentation in this, is in this problematic relationship between determination and non-determination. Uh, in terms of the relationship between the actual act of design and the background processes that predetermine the design or that they are there setting up a certain canvas in which architects are struggling to be uh, somehow to activate a certain relationship. We are confronted with different systems 
uh, every computer language has its own uh, predeterminated logic, its own way of actually activating space, meaning that every time we open uh, a software or we deal with a certain programming language, the ideology of the space is already set up in advance of uh, our design. In that sense, uh, what I became progressively interested is instead of going towards, uh, if you want, uh, expressive uh, design making, I was more interested in going backwards and to redefine the way that we, we relate with computer uh, science, uh, computer algorithms and ways of doing space. In this sense, uh, these are uh, projects by students in which we analyze the uh, relationship between a, a parametric design and how a parametric design may first analyze the logic of the software, how that software deals with organization, how the software preloads uh, spatial ideology, and see how a student can actually first explore the ranges of possibilities of that software to a certain limit, and then start engaging in a certain displacement of the logic of that uh, system. In this sense, that was a very simple parametric design using uh, Photoshop, and the coding was try is trying to activate a condition of the pixel in terms of uh, manufacturing a certain relationship and a certain reference in terms of how to make a space. So this project, for instance, is trying to open up the uh, a criticism in terms of how a pixel actually sets up a boundary space relative from positive to negative and thinking about inhabitation in terms of boundaries. Whether you are containing space, you're uh, in a threshold kind of space in the terms of a pixel, or whether you are contained uh, in a positive uh, negative figuration of space. This is a different exercise, and hopefully the, the point of these uh, very simple exercises are for students to be aware of the kind of conditions that you are uh, presented when you're dealing with computation. I usually work with uh, several languages, the more the better, different computational systems, the more the better. And uh, after a certain analytical condition, the idea is to start thinking about how to engage with the limits of that language and how to actually open up conditions for new coding and new languages possibilities. This is a processing exercise. In processing, when you open processing, uh, there's no background code. Uh, there's no uh, a, a background uh, condition in the software. So the student uh, started coding the, soft, the, the background space uh, in order to code the architecture that they were working with. So therefore, the relation between the figuration of the uh, project and the figuration of the background were understood as a one-to-one -one relationship. So therefore, the project, what it's trying to engage with is coding the background as important as coding the foreground. In that sense, uh, these uh, exercises uh, are also part of uh, our practice, uh, not only a teaching pedagogy, but the, the hope is to actually develop design conditions or design problems that they challenge the preconceptions uh, of, for instance, uh, in this case, Cartesian space. Uh, in this case, uh, we were working with uh, topological surfaces, scripting through mathematics, trying to understand the limitations on working with, for instance, Moebius strip, Klein bottle, and developing a, a threefold topological surface in which we would be able to engage the background uh, of each of the Cartesian axes and create a topology engaging back and forth between the positive and negative sides of each of the Cartesian planes and the uh, center and periphery of each of the, those planes. So what we develop is a six-fold topology in which uh, uh, x, y, uh, uh, and z axes are engaged in terms of positive, negative, center, and periphery. And we develop, obviously, uh, a house uh, prototype or a house project in which it could be curvilinear, it could be uh, in straight form. But what we wanted to do is to create a diagram that was truly three-dimensional and that actually, in its three-dimensionality, would actually start engaging with a certain displacement of the typical conditions uh, in terms of Cartesian uh, uh, background uh, space. So in that sense, um, uh, when we use uh, different uh, languages, when we use computation, uh, obviously, and as I have been seeing through the different presentations, uh, we understand that algorithms are the current reference today. We run algorithms uh, uh, all the time. We are loaded with thousands of algorithms in our uh, cell phones. And uh, the question is, 
how do we uh, deal politically with the conditions that algorithms present to us as architects, as designers, and what are the tools and the uh, available cognitive uh, elements that we have to overcome the predetermination of algorithms? Um, in that sense, it's a very difficult task. Uh, the algorithms are presenting a reference to us today. What I think is interesting is that uh, through the history of architecture, uh, we are uh, going through a, a very distinct paradigm change. I think that, uh, for instance, in the Renaissance, uh, we are closer to a paradigm set up by Brunelleschi in which the architect becomes also the technologist in the sense that if you really will, uh, would like to do something relevant today in relationship to algorithms, there's no other way around but actually to engage with the logic of how algorithms are developed and become a technologist in terms of engaging with the parameters that set up conditions for design. Uh, I think it's very difficult, it's very hard, but it is a linguistic problem. It has been happening uh, in many, many disciplines. Uh, it's happening in literature, it's happening in philosophy, it happens in, uh, across the world. And computations through, through algorithms are now becoming, of course, the kind of boundary, the barrier in terms of uh, cognition. So how do you make sure that the projects that you are engaging with or the projects that you are developing truly engage with the uh, political signification of contemporary problems such as algorithms. To me, uh, I developed uh, a series of uh, problems in terms of the relationship between uh, linguistic science and how language deals with predetermination. Uh, I, thinking that, uh, for instance, uh, when uh, we have a software, sof every so software is based on a, a computer language. And those computer languages on their, on, their, on their own side, they are based on uh, binary conditions and information uh, structures. Uh, in themselves, uh, in terms of cri cryptology, how to code information is in itself a cognitive problem. And the question is, how do you uh, understand, how do you activate through the design process, where is that boundary? Uh, there has been several cultural revolutions on the relation between language and, uh, 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 if you want, literature. Uh, in terms of Jacques Derrida, uh, in terms of this evolution, Jacques Derrida understood that every time we name something, every time we code something, or every time we assign a certain signification, we're actually creating knowledge, we're creating content. In that sense, uh, Roland Barthes uh, set up in the 1970s that the ultimate boundary for literature is language in itself. So in that sense, the uh, aim uh, that we have been trying to work on for several years is how to not only uh, analyze software and, and look at the ranges of possibilities, displace, what are the tools to displace uh, conventional algorithms and to displace uh, uh, software in itself in terms of background coding and open up uh, uh, the tools of the conditions that are uh, that usually belong to the foreground to the sorry to the background and activates through the foreground a certain reciprocity between background uh, coding and foreground design in that sense uh, we I think that architects we are moving very comfortably uh, within this realm up to this line right we know uh, very well how to work with uh, bifurcations, loops, uh, algorithms that are actually in themselves quite simple and conventional, but we are not used to uh, work on the tree, uh, non-tree-like structures on the uh, far right uh, in which uh, we claim that we are working on in terms of the design. In other words, uh, in terms of design, we're claiming that we are in a post-structuralist uh, era but in terms of the way that we use algorithms, we are actually in a very uh, primitive era because we are following very conventional uh, tree-like uh, structures and bifurcations. In that sense, for instance, uh, we're trying to work with blockchain. Blockchain technology is, for instance, one of these technologies that actually has been thought initially as a kind of, uh, if you want, a revealious way of using computation, a way of uh, understanding that uh, top-down uh, uh, networks were a problem and to uh, 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 explode the, the different uh, conditions of uh, entry data points and actually to actually reshuffle the system in terms of an open source and a collaborative environment in which nobody has the real control. Uh, we know that uh, nowadays we're all uh, governed by uh, Google and Facebook 
and uh, it, it's very problematic because they are all, uh, uh, if you want, top-down uh, systems. In that sense, uh, we need more of that uh, relationship. We need more of uh, understanding, if you want, the fact that form follows information and to activate a, a more, if you want, uh, precise loop on the relation between form and information. In that sense, uh, this is concerning computation and algorithms. But unfortunately, we are uh, in a paradigm change again. And this uh, is happening to be a, a different kind of game changer, which is big data. Big data, unfortunately for you, because you are trying to understand algorithms and computation, and that's actually uh, something a little bit of the past, in the sense that big data is changing the ratio between uh, the balance between algorithms and data. So for instance, before, uh, uh, until, if you want, 10 years ago, we were concerned about uh, developing algorithms, uh, heavy loaded uh, amount of energy in terms of algorithms, and very little amount of data. Now, that balance is totally flipping upside down. We are working with a lot of data, and actually the algorithms are becoming simpler and simpler. In that sense, the uh, relationship between uh, uh, the, the theory uh, data relationship is changing completely the way of uh, understanding reality uh, through uh, statistics, through uh, large amount of sources of data, and even the way that we are uh, thinking about machine learning, which is algorithms of algorithms. So the question is, uh, since 2010, uh, how is it that architecture changes relative to uh, big data? And this I'm, I'm shifting and presenting projects on the other side of uh, uh, computation, which is dealing with big data. Uh, so for instance, one of the biggest changes to me, uh, and it's something that we have been uh, exploring in Rome, is uh, history. How we deal with uh, hi the history of our discipline. And I think that big data, uh, as we know across the entire, uh, the different uh, sciences and the different uh, disciplines is changing the way that we think our own discipline. In that sense, we have the history of our discipline and interpretation of Borromini, San Carlo, uh, a Quattro Fontane, and we can apply, if you want, big data to the analysis of the multiple possibilities of what that building is supposed to be and how it's supposed to be organizing space, and think that perhaps what we think, we thought we knew about the building, uh, for instance, the relation between polycentric uh, geometry and the relation between the floor plan as an organizing principle and how actually Borromini ended up building the dome, uh, now can be challenged in terms of big data. Because once uh, you start dealing with big data, you start understanding that perhaps the way that you thought that the floor plan was organized is actually not the way the, floor, the building ended up being built. So therefore, the relationship between polycentric geometry or a different kind of geometry becomes part of the question. In that sense, this is a project, uh, 3D scanning project, in which uh, we were uh, analyzing the relation between Borromini and Rinaldi, uh, two historic uh, references for architecture, and trying to depict the relationship between different spaces and how they relate to each other in terms of uh, more discrete geometry using big data. Uh, so um, the images are a little bit dark, but this is a point cloud, uh, 220 million points, uh, RGB value. And the question was how to uh, uh, reread the relation between foreground and background, geometry in the plan versus the elevation, and so on. So uh, in that sense, the, what's happening with big data is that it's uh, reshuffling and reconsidering any theories about the object in relationship to uh, observation problems. So, New technologies, as we know, they set up uh, new lenses to see reality, and in that sense, uh, creates new theories of the objects and new means of signification. So in that sense, uh, what we are trying to do is to actually engage with survey uh, as an act of design. Data survey, gathering our own data and creating our own data sets as the initiators of uh, design conditions. In that sense, uh, this is a, pro a projective geometry problem. It's a 3D scanning of uh, Andrea Pozzo's corridor. And what we're trying to engage is on the relation between two dimensions, three dimensions, and multidimensionality. And we are actually trying to develop a sort of like an interactive interface in terms of uh, relating the space to the way the space is actually resisting its own representation. Because if you understand Andrea Pozzo, He's making a frescoes in which he's flattening out the ceiling. The ceiling is curved, 
but he's making a fresco in which he's flattening out the ceiling. So what we're trying to figure out is uh, a relation between two dimensions, three dimensions, and four dimensions that would ar articulate a different topological relationship between flat surface and deep space. So with that, uh, I finish. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Um, so we open up to the... Uh, round table discussion, so I ask please all the speakers to join here, so we have all the chairs set up. Um, Is it working? Hello. So I would like to uh, first thank all the speakers for the great presentation. I think we have seen a range of presentation, a range of scales, a range of approaches, a range of uh, different statements, I think, in relation to the work that we do the work that's been done and uh, reflecting on, uh, again, uh, computation and design and uh, vice versa. So I would like to um, open up the discussion talking about culture uh, and uh, uh, how uh, particularly uh, computational processes have generated and continue to generate a new culture or an emerging culture, but at the same time how the processes uh, the computational process somehow begin to encode a new way of thinking about culture. And when I talk about culture, I talk, I talk about culture in relation to design. So modes of practices, modes of thinking, modes of uh, uh, relating to the work, and modes of, again, uh, thinking about processes particularly. Can, um, I, I think uh, a very simple um, first comment could be uh, certainly computation allows to um, entangle actually mm -hmm. multiple uh, points of our environment, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's basically um, materials, it's basically people, it's basically space, it's, you know, I mean, and it's actually other disciplines. So it's various areas of knowledge, which we couldn't, right? In, in Borromini's time, I mean, basically they were, hand, they were hand drawings and they had uh, probably communication on the construction site. And, um, oh, Gaudi, right? I mean, directing complex surfaces actually on the construction site without any drawing. Um, so the question, of course, of computation allows us um, even detached from the con construction site to actually come up with uh, very abstract compositions, even hard to implement them, you know? Actually, in that sense, uh, uh, when I was referring to Br Brunelleschi, the interesting thing about the relation between Brunelleschi and Alberti is exactly that. Alberti set up that uh, architecture was about representation, and for the first time, he separated the relation between the architect and the building, as the architect as the author of the drawings that would be executed to do the building. And today, with computation, we are in a situation in which I think we are breaking that relationship, because uh, and I, that's why I claim that uh, Brunelleschi comes in as an important figure, because Brunelleschi was actually making sure that he was innovating at every level, at the construction level, at the way of pulling the material up to make the dome, at the, at the uh, representational level, because he was the first one to actually mathematically uh, uh, develop perspective, right? So not only at the level of representation, but also at the level of execution, breaking that relationship. Today with computation, I think we are closer to that paradigm in the sense that we are creating and executing the orders without bypassing notation. Like in other words, the, uh, to me the cultural revolution is that 
you don't need notation anymore because we are, you are actually executing the, the order, yeah. right? Uh, so in that sense, the question, the, 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 there is a complicated relation between culture and technology, and that evolves and changes. Today, we are in a technocratic society. Technology is the driving force. So the question is, for architecture to be relevant again, how do you make sure that you as an architect uh, in a kind of like lower level discipline, you engage with technology at the level that the society is asking you to, to behave? I think in that sense, what you said about the, the, the being technologies is a, the, the important kind of missing moment now that we are all in transition with in terms of claiming back cultural re uh, relevance through technology by ourselves being engaged into new systems of representation, new software, and new fabrication uh, systems. And I think this definitely you know, goes back to what some of the things, you know, the notion of ordership, right, at the same time. So I think the encoding of uh, processes, I think when also when we talk about culture, I think we, you know, we talk about culture encoded in dif different scales, right? So from the scale of production making thinking, but also to the scale of the larger society, right? So, and I think this goes back to, again, computational use, computation and processes, and the notion, again, of authorship in relation to certain type of thinking as well. Um, I'm, I think it's actually quite meaningful that uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first two responses to the question of um, the formation of uh, contemporary computational culture, or how, how the question is formed, I forget, uh, are examples of either Gaudi about 100 years ago or Brunelleschi some 300 year or so years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that to, to misconceive computational culture like it started around 1996 uh, and then you are the children or grandchildren of the first computational designers is sort of, I think, a misreading and of where things begin uh, and the histories are prehistories. Um, but I think to, to respond to the notion of authorship, uh, I'm not sure what the opposite of authorship is, or do we just receive and follow and conform to certain kinds of norms and we kind of act out. Um, and it, it sort of uh, suggests to me that there's um, a kind of historical relationship to authorship that involves tradition in, in some sense. And when we say culture, we actually talk about the formation of of shared traditions. Uh, and in some sense, what um, used to be called tradition is now sort of understood as either cultural appropriation or even plagiarism, in effect. Uh, and I think that's maybe what, what Pablo, you're somewhat kind of targeting in some sense, is that not so much that we plagiarize when we use software, but that we don't have the capacity necessarily, many of us, uh, to offer something wholly original or unique. Yet what's curious about the software, and maybe in these terms, is that it creates certain kinds of traditions without even um, uh, uh, willing it to happen. For me, another uh, very interesting part is basically that this is the first time in, uh, in history of architecture that uh, architects are no longer just artists and builders, but they're actually scientists. And everyone can find their own way, basically, to be a scientist in this world. And f uh, basically, all of us have m master's degree here, but a lot of times, actually, they're not. We're not following exactly what we uh, were taught to in school. We were just finding our own way. But in some way, now we actually need a lot of uh, more skills, which have to do with what we need to execute. So it's more scientific, uh, the culture that it's uh, becoming, rather than. Uh, artistic in a way. So ro robotics are coming into play and uh, algorithms and we're becoming more and more coders and we're working with all these uh, rule sets that we create and we're looking at taxonomy, something that even our V2 is uh, working in uh, some way. Uh, something that um, uh, in a way it, uh, it's like uh, more relevant today more than ever. Yeah, and I think the question of authorship or it's not just about the designer or the maker. It's uh, getting to your point about tradition, and I think that uh, you know we we can we can now build anything anywhere. It's not tied to the local trades, or to the, even to the local materials. We we could be very far away. It's a kind of a global society that we're working with, and you know we see that from some of the presentations that map out what's what's going on around the world, and you can easily send files around. But I think that. Um, 
you know, a local, uh, a, a, a local uh, stone or stone quarry is, is still out there. And I think that people are still, the, the, the trades are getting um, maybe a bit lost in terms of passing on the knowledge generationally. So I think that the culture is definitely going through the paradigm shift of not, it not being tied to local traditions and somehow being handed, uh, handed around in a different way, where it's, it's the, 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 the authorship might be more globally shared. Well, in that sense, uh, I have to clarify something about authorship, because uh, uh, the first time when we did Acadia 2010 at Cooper Union, the entire idea was to uh, set up putting the table this problem of authorship. And actually, Mario Carpo was totally against us, uh, because Mario Carpo was saying that uh, we, which is true. If, I mean, you have to see, uh, look at both sides, right? Because on the one hand, Mario Carpos argues that uh, we live in a very complex uh, society, which is true, and we have layers of authorship. Uh, there's no, you cannot really trace the origin of today. It's impossible. We are in a, such a level of complexity that actually the serendipity and the open-ended of, of multiple the combinations is, is accelerating, right? We are ex in an expanding universe in which uh, you know is it the, the logic of the universe is emergent both uh, in its expansion and it's in in what we think it happened before. So in that sense, the question of authorship is very problematic. When when I was trying to engage in terms of authorship, the problem was that people were using software just automatically, just the latest software, and say, "Ah, look what I can do." When in reality, the software designer was already setting up all the conditions for you to. Uh, explore and then the architect Mario uh, Mario was comfortable with that and I said well hold on a minute what about the architect as a programmer right why we don't have that kind of hybrid new uh, condition and that's when the entire conversation uh, uh, played and now Mario I think is changing because now he's talking about uh, Alberti and Brunelleschi the way that I, that I was pointing out in 2010 so he is kind of realizing that the technology is part of architecture is coming up as, a, as an issue in itself so, you know, it's an open, it's not really defined, or, and it's, it's problematic, the relationship. So, one more question from the audience uh, for the speakers, and then we can open up to the audience. Um, so, I think we have seen in our range of presentation, uh, and also I think the notion of materiality and computation, I think it's relevant, not relevant, but I think emerge as a kind of underlying theme, I think, in all the, the presentation, right? and talking about also, you know, from the macro scale to the urban scale. Um, so I'm interested in expanding more, again, I think on the duality of uh, indeterminacy versus predictability, right? And at the same time, uh, begin to think about, again, uh, so the indeterminacy that, you know, exists in a, in a way within the process, but at the same time, we have the reappropriation and the emergence of the material space, right? With the fabrication, with the materiality, with the different scale of materials. So rethinking the physical plane, the physical scale. So how do we, um, so how do we rethink uh, modes of production, right? There are no standard, and how we can begin to think again, again, you know, seriality, modes of production, but also the role of designer within that perspective. If we look at, at um, not just, at, I, I think we are, the discussion I think is, is very much interior to architecture, but I think we have to be careful because we, um, we wanna actually not isolate our discourse actually just within the discipline. And if we look at the larger markets today, and I mean in product or service design across disciplines, so what we realize is that um, over the last maybe 10 or, or 15 years, the um, question of, of designing a, a product, the quest was first make it cheaper, the second one was actually make it better, and the most recent understanding is, why don't we just make better products, mm -hmm. right? So <coughs> I think we can actually map that to architecture and say, all right, the price is a product, right? And, and we are still in a, in a profession where we talk about the singular, right? Um, so at which point act actually does come in um, the client or the user right, that actually, actually determines what the, what the product will be and wants it very personalized. Right? Everything around us is personalized. We want to have our lifestyle impregnated to the product. We all want a product that is very customized, super customized and, and, and personalized. Yeah? Now, since we have computation, 
we can infold, if we, if we think about the design process, which is actually a circle, iterative. You can put as, as much data into the design process as you want. You know, it's unlimited. So the, the way how we inf uh, put the flavor of, of data and information to your design process will actually shape the outcome. So it is indeterminate in a sense because you have a lot of data that you fold in. But I think, it, I think for me it's very uh, important maybe to point out to the younger generation that uh, we have to be very careful that we actually don't lose, um, not from a business point of view, the market, but we actually answer the real people needs. Right? I think we are beyond, as I said before, communication. We are beyond co uh, computation. We are in an age of materiality and which allows us to respond locally to real social needs and user needs. And those can be infolded at, uh, with data. I think the way that, my, my Charlie, you, you frame the question is that perhaps, I mean, it could be misunderstood in some ways, not that you frame it so much this way, uh, that the ways of working today and worldviews uh, and kind of very precise kind of methodologies that, that we work with, both um, uh, computationally and materially, uh, are a choice between determinism or indeterminism or predetermination or um, uh, predictability versus unpredictability. And I don't think that's the case at all, and I don't think that's necessarily what you mean. Uh, but I think it could be misconstrued that you can either go down a path of indeterminacy or remain quite certain about everything. And I think within the, qu the question for me is about the context within which the question's asked. Uh, our world, whether it's ecologically, is wholly instable at the moment and will continue to be. Um, socially and politically, we live in very, very uh, uh, questionable times in terms of certainty. Um, uh, on many levels economically, we know that the markets that we've created that are, are certainly can be deployed towards making our products and our world much more personalized, etc., but are deeply unstable as well. Uh, and I think all of these sorts of conditions are preconditions to work as architects, absolutely. It's the world that we work and live in and are commissioned in and our buildings exist in. And even our buildings don't last forever. We presume that our architecture has permanence, yet we know that material decays and uses become dis you know, building becomes dysfunctionally in terms of its use, etc. Uh, so I think that the, the absolute context that we work in or the context has absolute um, indeterminacies and uncertainties built into it, that this is not so much a choice, but almost a necessity to accept. Yeah, I agree. I think this is, again, it's not about duality, so one excludes the other one, but actually seeing both existing and coexisting as a productive category for design. So it's not about this versus the other one, right? So, but how, again, we begin to embrace both at the same time um, within, again, within what is predictable, what is not, but at the same time, how again, a part of the process in itself. The, the other interesting thing relative to whether you serve reality or you uh, actually subvert reality, what's happening to me with information theory is that uh, in a way, we are really enabling ourselves through algorithms to directly inform reality real time. So in that sense, to me, the, the, uh, what I call the architecture of information is the uh, kind of empowerment of the architect to actually map in 3D scanner space, map a space, map a flow of systems, and actually intervene directly at the representational level, uh, which proves a little bit what you were saying about the bit and the atom, right? And in a sense, uh, we are in a, in a moment now in which by understanding the right algorithm, you can actually explode the world. I mean, the world can literally go upside down if you hit on the right algorithm. That's what uh, Google and Facebook are demonstrating, right? Mm -hmm. it, that, that's the kind of uh, kind of bad good side of these uh, mega corporations. That uh, we now understand that by mapping reality, mapping reality is more important than uh, acting into reality because the question is more important than the solution. In that sense, the the key factor of uh, Google mapping the world is a is a kind of a philosophical opening up of possibilities in terms of looking at what's really going on. And then Uber, of course, making profit of that and literally changing the entire flow and functioning of the city. Uh, in that sense, I, we have uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, work with uh, algorithmic processes in urbanism that we actually tested real time that we didn't show today, but uh, that's another issue. Yeah, what, where is the architecture of information today? Where is the, the, the key uh, element that you can, uh, with a little less amount of effort, 
you can create more damage yeah. instead of like actually serving reality, let's say, right? Uh, uh, because serving reality could also be uh, problematic in a sense, right? Because then that means that you're not questioning reality, you know? You're like a service provider. I was always wondering, <coughs> um, I mean, when you, when you do a Google search and you talk about architecture, very often you, you might actually find out information architecture. It has nothing to do with architecture. Suddenly you realize, oh, it's about software engineering. And I think um, my kind of uh, teaser somehow is um, bits to atoms, bits are atoms, that what we learn uh, in terms of spatial understanding and maybe uh, handling uh, data complexity visually is actually an advantage for the architect because we have to think about architecture as a scaleless enterprise today. So, all right, maybe I showed um, buildings and we showed um, other types of kind of constructs, but architecture actually happens on very levels. Architecture today is on a nano level, right? So if we have basically physicists that try to understand why certain atoms in, a, in its geometric configuration determine material properties, right? That's kind of a fact. Um, or why certain atoms in the geometric configuration determine actually molecular conditions which actually con uh, condition life today. Physicists have no understanding of spatial, uh, have no spatial learning as we do. So the, I'm, I'm saying the architect is actually in the position today um, to engage spatial conditions in architecture at a level where you can actually, in a transdisciplinary um, collaboration, make the next step on a 20-year roadmap, which is actually to make materials which can, you can grow anywhere. The only solution to sustainability, and I think that's why I believe in a 20-year roadmap, is we will grow materials anywhere. Right? If we right now, for example, ex uh, experiment in a medical school with a bioprinter, all right, uh, the quest is can we print a kidney tomorrow? But I read that, all right, he can actually grow cells on any type of feedstock, build matrices. The architect comes in because he has a spatial understanding how the cells have to configure to actually build structural stability on the matrix, at which point we are uh, actually at a very good stage already of saying we can grow tomorrow materials anywhere we want, and the architect is relegated to the role specifying what properties you want and understanding which kind of characteristics you would have in terms of aesthetics, right? And I think it, this for me is, is kind of super exciting. I'm too old to engage <laughs> in, yeah, but that's a question for the new generation. I just understand kind of the link from the nanoscale to the actual architectural building, right? And this will go beyond then the classic building of buildings. Right? I think we can open up to the audience. Any questions? We have a mic going around. Hi, thank you for sharing your research and your work, first of all. And um, I mean, we, we keep talking about uh, uh, data and information. And when everything becomes data and information, which one are the essential one? Which one are the one that are topical for us? I think that uh, it's important for us as uh, professionals and for students to understand how select and how to critically filter those data information, to understand which one would uh, enable us with the minimum, minimal sensitive action to identify those places where we can have the biggest positive reaction, not negative reaction in some way, right? So to have a kind of a minimal gesture, as Gregotti was, was saying, that gets the big result. So how do we filter those data? How do we cross-relate those data? And how do we select becomes more important than collecting everything. Because mm -hmm. if you collect everything, it's almost like, as Kachari says, you cannot remember everything. You forget everything. So you have to be uh, careful in how to filter those. So we have to enable students to build the critical filters to be able to understand which one are the crucial ones. And in this passage where we went through philosophically, when in the 80s and 90s, technology meant a detachment from reality. Technology meant a detachment between object and field. Now technology is going back in understanding how the object is integrated into the field and how technology can help him be contextual and more contextual through material, through technology, through understandings also of formal solution, space making that are proper of a certain context. I think that's the great potential that these um, uh, tech 
tools offer to us? How do we land and in which way our landing is different than yesterday because of the use of these tools? How do we land in reality and identify which one are the places and which one are the forms that can build public realm and a better living or daily experience for everyone? That's our job. But right. you hit on the problem of big data, actually, which is uh, that actually you cannot really choose because if you choose, that means that you are providing a solution to a, a, a question that instead of opening up the, the problem that the data is actually opening up for you as a kind of uh, cognitive paradigm. So the, the, the flipping of the equation that happened in 1970 with big data is the discovery that actually the, the statistic design is actually purposely created in order for you to open up the conditions that you are not ready to accept. So in that sense, uh, choosing is very problematic. Uh, actually, I tell my students that actually if you are in a situation of choosing, you already uh, uh, lost the game because that means that you're not understanding the, con the preconditions of your decision. The, the uh, problem is that the, the data should help us in uh, building open processes, open design processes, but they have to be still a design has to be... But, choice, but right? you're hitting on a problem which is uh, in, in data survey, the problem is what question do you ask and what, how, uh, what are the instruments of gathering data and what get data you're actually looking for because you are going to get what you're looking for. That's the problem, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So the more I work with data, it, it is actually really problematic because you don't know when to stop, you don't know which questions to ask, and it's like a complete feedback. Now there was a paper uh, uh, published uh, two weeks ago that actually says that the last 10 years of research based on big data is totally useless because uh, there has been uh, used a lot of uh, uh, resources and conditions for things that people don't really understand and therefore that cannot be proven. So it's like it's a, it's a big uh, problem. In a, in a way, it's not resolved. But the question is what do you do? You have to engage with it and you have to be uh, uh, aware of the conditions that that, that is uh, precluding. The question is how do you prepare an algorithm that it would be able to actually recognize that the moment that you filter that data, you're already creating the, the, the paradigm and the solution for that data. So it's very problematic. But the filter, I think, comes from the overlapping of data, from the understanding of what are the reactions when you overlap sensitive data, and then you can understand the consequences of those uh, kind of, and that's in the critical understanding. It's not precluding the possibilities, but in trying to overlap and see what is the constant that leads you to a specific So, yes, yeah, it's kind of, a, you're, you're alluding to a kind of a pattern recognition, right? And we, I mean, we have also to consider that um, we will, or we already have actually algorithms that make decisions, yeah. so design decisions. Yeah. So we have to be confronted at one point that we don't make necessarily the pre-filtering, it's done by an algorithm. So he, he, he creates the patterns that you actually are looking for and then you basically just make the final step. And you know, we, get, we get maybe beyond the moment of the, of the 90s where we were saying, all right, now you have in, infinite uh, gener generations of images and solutions when do I freeze the process? So we're getting to the moment that just by having enough data input, pattern recognition, that you will actually understand why certain decisions are made. I also would like to thank the panel for their very lofty and complex thoughts, processes, and constructs. I think each one was quite uh, incredible for us to uh, listen to and think about. Um, I think I'm going to take Giovanni's question a little bit further. Uh, I mean, uh, already Tom mentioned inequality and instability in our world. I think the, we identify technology as being the strongest thing, but I think today's world, it's not technology, it's the military industrial complex that's the most powerful. And, that, and if we don't have any control over the, uh, the authorship of this work, how do we control all the good work you've done to be uh, applicable to destruction of the world? I think it, you're, you're touching on a, a really important, more uh, general and very serious question about technology and the misuse of technology and the history and philosophy of technology and how tools can be misused effectively. Um, I'm not sure if what uh, this group of designers is doing has the risk like the military complex that you describe has in terms of um, either claims that good is being done to the world or destruction. Um, but I think that all tools have the potential to be misused. 
and in a in a more um, sort of upbeat sense, I think that this is what we do very much in uh, contemporary design culture, to get back to maybe the first question that uh, Marcella had asked. Um, so much of what we were talking about computational culture was never intended to be designed for architects. Um, so much of the software we use was misused. It was either intended for Hollywood animation in the 1990s or it was uh, intended either for engineers or for product design or uh, and architects have this serial capacity to steal software applications and use them or um, uh, various kinds of ideological or philosophical approaches and appropriate them, uh, particular tools, whether they're associated or not. Uh, and I think this is a condition that I see as really quite productive for architecture is the misuse of tools in some sense. Not so much in the realm of the danger of the misuse, but the potential benefits of the misuse. <coughs> A lot of the graphing techniques that each of you have mentioned actually have been uh, very, very quickly implemented by the military. All these drones and, and rockets that follow people and find ways to kill them have been actually part of this technology. Well, you disagree? The most problematic condition today is what's happening to Google. That officially, I mean, if you take a look at the structure of organization of Google, is uh, basically a, an extension of the military complex. And that there's a lot of people inside Google that actually are pulling out because they realize what you're saying. Uh, that's like the, the most problematic political boundary today is happening at that level. And actually the same with Facebook. Obviously we know that the election was hij hijacked by Facebook, so who has the control of that? Uh, so Google and Facebook are both, one way or another, taken by uh, uh, all the apparatus that you're referring to. It's already gone. Actually, Mark Zuckerberg, has no idea what, what, I mean, we all know that he's being spied, he's not really in control of Facebook, and uh, Google is, is, is going through a similar transition. It's, it's being seen now as a public uh, company uh, belonging to the US. Like in other words, they put the boundary and they say, okay, this boundary five years ago, you cannot really cross this boundary, and already that's why they're doing missiles now, right? Which is very problematic. More questions? Uh, what do you do? Well, actually, I disagree because to me, I have a, a, a very strict political relationship with computation, and I am trying to address what you're what you're raising up. In my work, I am very radical about it. I don't let it go. And I so think so that I'm every. I'm trying to you mean like to implement it. In, I mean, imply in any way that any of you are thinking it's to be used that way. <laughs> but but it's just. But they are right because you are saying that technology and uh, uh, gives up a certain kind of condition that perhaps is beyond your control. Uh, and I think that that's what I'm trying to do with my work. I'm trying to realize that there is a political dimension embedded within technology, and that you as an architect, you really need to deal with that boundary. To me, the fact that uh, uh, Facebook is taking over public space, right? Facebook is, is, a, is a public platform that is private, that is taking over social relationships and is building up a virtual uh, uh, social space, right? So that is a political dimension. So how do you deal with that? Uh, I think it's an architectural problem. It's, it's not outside of the, our discipline. And it's actually the, the recognition of Facebook and, and Google is the, the fact that they realize that it was much more architectural than what we initially thought. And I think that they are ahead of the game in that sense. I think maybe answering to the question on the, on the military complex, I think we can't do anything. Um, I think that's uh, beyond our, our understanding. But I think we can use probably um, some of the research um, and when it, I'm interested in this kind of question of materials, and definitely the Department of Defense is the one who has really huge research dollars, and a lot of those go actually into material science. And and we all know the tanks they were sending in the war um, to Saudi Arabia had the first time a self-healing skin, right? So basically, the bullets went into the tank surface. 
they were uh, uh, transformed, agglomerated within the material, disappeared, and the skin actually closed behind. Right? So now we're on the next level. So what does it mean now, actually, that I create a material anywhere I want? That's actually a DARPA um, research call from 2016. I assume there's knowledge in this country at this point who actually understands how to make research um, materials out of cellular um, data. Right? So we have to see it from the positive side. Something of that will swap over to the architectural field and will benefit. Uh, um, GPS, it was also mili uh, the first thing was, was, mili was, was first used in the military. And if we now had a handheld on our phone, the GPS, it's because, yeah, that's the research. Yeah. More questions from the audience? Yes. Thank you very much for um, inspiring us to think about computational processes. And after uh, the uh, panel, I just have uh, this one confusion about, I think it's very kind of self-contradicting to relate culture to computational processes, because I find it very hard to pin down like, the identity of a design if you can move it like all around without a specific site, if you can extract it from its site and then just put it everywhere. Do you think it's bringing, it's focusing on the same debates of local versus global? It's relating, I think it's relating to our like history classes where we're talking about regionalism and vernacular architecture versus internationalism of this local and versus the global concept. Do you think this is making it more acute sustainability versus if you can just move things everywhere? Modern movement probably had the same problem, which I think that references that you're uh, citing in some ways about critical regionalism was a response, a reaction to what was perceived as sameness and ubiquity. You know, the, the, the same exactly. kind if of. If you can't, if you like, one thing it uh, involves a lot of like you can't. It's I think it's become harder and harder to actually say that one thing it's just solely made by one person. It's always a collaboration now. It's always like some part is from like Asia and some part is from other world, other parts of the world. I think you've dislocated a profound cultural shift uh, from the idea in modernism that there would be individuals and heroes, and um, I, I, I think that is also in question today. Um, and that the notion that architecture is made or conceived by one person in modernism was a kind of ideological belief. Um, and I think that's connected in some ways to the star system, which you can critique pervades digital production. Um, but I think there's a profound cultural shift to a collaborative <coughs> ways of working um, in, a, in a digital culture in a sense that you can share information and design information in a, a, a model effectively uh, and uh, work um, in parallel and, and simultaneously uh, on a project so differently than when we had to work m more manually in collaboration. Uh, and I think that the, the problem that you describe of a project being able to migrate or be sort of anywhere uh, is sort of part and parcel of a kind of collaborative mode of uh, digital practice um, that's uh, as much connected to the systems of information flow as they are uh, of how we communicate internationally and how we send information around the world um, to how we might send information around a design team. It's almost the same systems that allow uh, me to send to my design partner two meters away to uh, 15,000 kilometers away, for example. Yeah. Do you think it's making like the concept of culture less related to a geographical site? Like nowadays, it's not a specific location that you call it a culture anymore, mm. or a country is I just... Well, also, I mean, the, the, the boundary between nationalities are irrelevant. Right? I think in that sense, we, we are experiencing a, a kind of a feedback, negative uh, kind of uh, pendulum movement between nationalisms against, uh, a, of course, uh, an international cultural growth. And you see it in the environment also. You cannot think of, uh, 
of a solution in the environment that is local is ridiculous, right? Because any any kind of uh, weather effect reverberates around the world. The same happens with information technologies. You cannot think that, uh, I mean, any bit, any bit of information has the potential to replicate and transform the world. The question is, what's your the relative level of authorship to me that you have within that spectrum? Uh, I agree that we share information and we are all within a layered condition. But the question is, how do you make sure that you're doing something that is relevant and you're not just simply designing? Uh, that's to me the, the question. But the other exciting part for me is that we're not only designing buildings anymore, we're actually designing tools that we can share. So right now that we were talking about authorship, it's actually you are an author of a plugin, for instance, or something that is helping and aiding design, but then you're releasing it to other designers in order to create and to push it further and to um, you know, open the space for more creativity. And I think that that's, again, like it's the first time that this is happening where an architect is not only a maker, we don't a anymore, it's just a totally different way of thinking. And also you have these forums which uh, have to do with grasshopper and forums um, that, that, that people share information, but people don't only share information, they actually start collaborating, they actually start creating better and more better products and better and better architecture because uh, they know what they do. Like it's uh, shared information in all the world. They, they all know what uh, everyone has to contribute and uh, to share. And it's a very exciting moment because you can become a part of this culture in any moment just by opening your computer. Uh, well, before, uh, eight uh, years ago, it was a very a small cast, a very small group of people that were designing. They were the uh, star architects. They were the ones that had the connections. But it's the first time that, uh, you know something? It, uh, it all depends on your skill. And your skill is the one that is going to prove how good you are and you can find other people to collaborate. And it's not anymore about being a player, uh, just one person who is uh, going to design. It's about being a team, being a team player, being good in what you do, being a scientist. Yeah, I like that. that basically, what it means, we will actually right now, very soon, talk about jam sessions, right? We are very close to music. You know, that's basically, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's like it's, exactly. yeah, it's improvisation, so, yes, right? Yes. Um, you join in and you put your flavor on top and somebody else put the flavor in and then something uh, comes out and maybe it's fun and exciting or maybe it's just failing. I mean, right. to me in that sense, the, the, the reason why uh, this, this happened is that we realized that the parameters of design are actually more important than the design in itself. That's what I was trying to articulate with the information theory. That, see, that happened, I think, in 2010 when architects, uh, Grasshopper 2004, but in 2010, the fact that architects started developing their own uh, tools, if you want, to me they are beyond tools. It's not only a tool, it's an instrument, it's a system of representation that has symbolic form, it has many different things. And actually it did happen through history. If you think about Brunelleschi, uh, Brunelleschi developed a system of representation that then was useful across <coughs> other countries. In that sense, to me, culturally speaking, we are not yet at that level, perhaps. Like some architects were actually more sophisticated, like Palladio, what Palladio did with Perfecti, or uh, what uh, other architects, how other architects dealt with systems of representation. To me, the interesting thing today relative to what uh, you were saying in terms of information theory is uh, how do we think about uh, multidimensional uh, space? I am trying to figure out if there is a way for, uh, to figure out how to represent space beyond three dimensions adding multiple dimensions, which has to do with uh, how you are actually dealing with multi-dimensional scripting, which is a <coughs> problem uh, that Google is having with the, with the algorithm that is actually has 17 dimensions, 18 dimensions, right? How do you visualize that? How do you organize information in three dimensions, in, in other dimensional terms? So that is the, the other issue. I think this question is, is also interesting because it opens to the shift of the paradigm. We moved from the model of the modern time, right, when everyone was upset by creating model. And architecture scale or a city scale model that were replicable and applicable both top down to the places to the development of methodology. Now we don't talk about models anymore, but more about methodology. They are open and performable to the different sides. And I think that's a big shift, a cultural shift. It's not only a shift in terms of tools. We have one question back there. So 
So um, as a first year student, I've come to um, know about some architects who have like certain ideologies and approaches to uh, build it. And they are like, um, Louis Sullivan, he was like, form follows function. And then Frank Lloyd Wright is like, his building has to like <coughs> um, mimic nature and be in sync with nature. And then Le Corbusier comes around and he's like, they should mimic a machine and be more efficient. And uh, from what you guys just said, uh, what I, the feedback I'm getting is that like, in our day, we are now trying to experiment more the possibilities of how uh, software tools can deform and then transform a conventional uh, shape. And so uh, now the question to me is like, the question that I want to pose is, after all this experimentation, what are we trying to um, give back to society? Like, what are we trying to tell them, like the ordinary clients, that what are, uh, like, what should be the feeling that they should be, um, they should feel in the designs that we give to them through software manipulation and all of that. That's what I want to know. Wow. <laughs> Big question. It's a very big question. Um, I think he said he said also that we are on uh, software tools, etc. I, I don't think that we, we were beyond in our discussion uh, understanding software as tools. I think that it's all about, uh, at the end of the day, supply and demand. So the person who actually is ordering, uh, building what the, they care about is actually optimizing the process for them, making things easier, prefabricating parts, uh, making the process faster. Uh, so that's what actually the reality of architecture is today, unfortunately. There is no... Uh, you know, there is not so much about, uh, th they don't care so much about the theory. We're the ones that actually care about <laughs> about all this theoretical discussion, but uh, out there it's, um, it's another type of world. And uh, we are the ones who actually need to bring this sensitivity to architecture and to the people who are actually financing it. And that's another, you know, a whole other story, which is very difficult. And uh, everyone is uh, from the architecture world is trying to tackle and to uh, give a good uh, product, but it's not always happening because of, you know, the way that the the world lives uh, to, uh, today, not just architects. But actually, I would argue that uh, we are in a in a in a much better uh, position today because, for instance. We have architects uh, working, uh, organizing reality with Uber, or, or architects working uh, at, uh, in Silicon Valley. You know, I had like students of mine that are actually being hired for like actually a lot of money in Silicon Valley, or informing reality at a very different level than what we were used to. I think that the architecture and urbanism of information it means that actually form follows information means that. At a certain point, you not you're not re we're not really any longer designing shapes. I think we're in a much more interesting position today, in which we are actually setting up the conditions for a new world to come. And the question is how we are opening up possibilities. Uh, that's what we are giving to society. I think in that sense, we are to me we are expanding reality, uh, literally. Uh, and if you design one good algorithm, you can change the world today. I think that this is. Uh, being literally, <laughs> literally. Yeah. yes. I think also that we, um, one other thing that, that we didn't maybe touch here today was actually AI, and what will AI actually do in the design fields? And I think we just have to understand that um, the collection of data <coughs> will actually expand much more into detail about our own human behavior. We will learn through AI much more how we speak, how we feel, how our face muscles, because 43 face muscles, how they actually move without us even knowing, right? Because uh, uh, there's optic scanners that tell us how our face actually responds emotionally. And all of those things, which are very much about, um, I think, creating a new understanding of empathy, will actually have, I think, a profound uh, impact upon us making our first design framing of the problem, right? or, or understanding of who our clients are. And we probably can even imagine that if you come in with a first prototype and you throw it against the client, that 
you might have a reaction, but actually AI will tell you what the underlying reaction really is, right? I mean, I think it will be much more, or people, or people actually moving into space. So when when um, Pablo before uh, showed us those beautiful um, scans, spatial scans of classical buildings, right, that actually take the status quo, now we can actually send people inside, and we can actually have a, an understanding of the data, collect the data, how people respond emotionally to buildings built at a time from Corbusier or from Borromini, etc. And we will be able to understand the data and actually implement it in our new designs. Right? So I think there is a, a lot of um, very exciting uh, potential how AI, VR, uh, and MR will actually change the paradigm of how we design and how computation actually unfolds in the new kind of understanding of space. By the way, Facebook is already doing that. That's uh, what he actually says, is describing the, the social uh, psychological algorithm of Facebook, which recognizes how long, how many milliseconds you spend in an image, how many likes you give into an image, and then profiles your uh, psychological uh, uh, understanding better than you. Uh, Facebook knows more about you than you know about yourself. In that but sense, it's a when, when that starts looping, <coughs> the field right, is actually responding to manipulate your behavior. So we are already in a post-human uh, society in which we are being manipulated by our feedback relationship with arti artificial intelligence. It's already happening. And actually, we are all being manipulated as we, as we speak. Just one last question to the distinguished panel. How do you think the information that you have been working so hard on is going to affect the architectural education. But how do you, where do you see the, the future of architecture students and the education <coughs> process that they will be part of? Is it any different than, than 20 years ago? Or, and if it is, how, what, how do you describe it? I think we're in an incredibly interesting era. Um, of architectural education relative to what your earlier question was asking about technology. Um, and not so much the passing down of technology, but it's quite organic consumption. I mean, this generation here are what I guess is called um, digital natives. Uh, unlike, well, maybe some, I'd, I'd include myself, I don't know, as the non-digital native. Uh, and I think there's a culture of learning uh, of people that don't actually remember not having computers around uh, and from very early age have been already immersed within technology even in, uh, whether they knew it or not from the sort of things that Pablo is talking about uh, were immersed in interfaces and were immersed within kind of, uh, a, a facility of, of production. So I think the, the question isn't so much well what are we going to teach but how are we going to steer a generation of people that are already quite immersed in all of the sort of um, tangible or intangible technologies and, and whether we call them design technologies or not. Uh, and I, I think that's quite exciting. I, I, I think things have changed dramatically, part, partly because we don't know to the extent they've changed because it's this generation that will have such facility. Um, uh, for example, about 10 years ago, uh, I was charged with charting the future of um, design technologies at the University of Hong Kong. And the plan had a five-year phasing out of things. And some of my older colleagues uh, were wondering, well, that just sounds ridiculous. Well, how could you be phasing things out? And I was arguing that in five years, we just won't have to teach certain things because the students will know it before they come in to first year. And I think that's part, part possibly already happening now. <laughs> maybe not for those teaching first year, they might argue differently. Um, or there may be a, a different level of facility and greater potential than ever has been in terms of the, the, the capacity for learning. And, and uh, learning includes misuse and production of um, unpredictable outcomes that we may, um, we may not even kind of expect at this stage. But it seems the paradigm shift is architect and the scientist versus architect as a builder or a thinker, right? It's how do we how do we make I mean, these I, people I, into yeah. scientists, uh, or or should they be? Well, um, the, most, the most interesting parts of science are the, are the one are the, are the 
are the ways of working are not so much about proof of a corollary or theory of some sort, but actually the invention of things that we don't know. And in that sense, science can be very uh, well, productive as a kind of creative force. Uh, and we tend to sort of think as science as deterministic uh, and not really, and the opposite of a kind of creative or artistic practice. Yes. And I think with computation, that those dualities or those um, uh, conflicts just are, are uh, much more enmeshed and much more complex and not as sort of simple in some ways as setting up that, that kind of opposition. But the Gogine told us a lot about how science can be creative. And, uh, but actually, it also goes back to the, the, the definition of what architecture is. If you think about architecture as a non-separation between technology and art, right, then you go to a different uh, paradigm. I think in the US in general, there is a huge divide between artistic architects and technical architects. It's like incredible to me that separation. What is uh, to me in, in other uh, areas of the world, it's like you, you really know, you didn't need to know how to build because knowing how to build means a way of communication through the language of the filming construction. To me, that applies to algorithms and applies to robotic uh, fabrication and so on. Like in other words, there's no, there should be no separation in cognitive terms between technicalities and cultural-based uh, uh, creativity. I think in uh, um, answering to the question, um, it appears that the future of education will be um, a, a more flexible and dynamic process of learning. Um, and learning, uh, we are on the, you know, on the way of capturing ways of learning that we traditionally did not capture. And with that, I want to say that the degree will actually slightly go away or be complemented by other types of uh, credentials and certifications. And there's one constant um, and one advantage to architecture or design education in general, and this is the design studio. As a unique vehicle, of inter or transdisciplinary collaboration, I think it will persist in time and will be, as we know, right now uh, absor uh, absorbed by other disciplines as I understand the advantages of actually bringing various disciplines together on the table. So if we see that as a constant, then actually all the seminars and courses we are running right now, they might maybe be replaced by skill building site um, uh, modules that can be chosen by the student according to passion, according to interest, or according to maybe pathway or future uh, professions. Right? And you can circle those around the design studio. And by that, then, we will actually create, a, I think, a very dynamic and flexible design education, which then hopefully can respond uh, to questions even in other disciplines that they are unable to answer. Right? I, think th I think that's, for me, I think a very exciting point. And I think that's our advantage also, right? that we have that experience in our students have that experience. So they're not really shy about accepting an understanding uh, point of view of somebody else on the table about their design idea. Actually, they absorb and accept it. An engineer does not, right? Or a, lib or a li liberal um, artist does maybe not necessarily do that as well. So the design studio we have to actually keep holy and actually make it something even more stronger than it is maybe today. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone to thanks the speakers and thank the audience. So we really hope that this conversation will expand <laughs> in the classroom, in studio and all the future events here at the School of Architecture. Thanks everyone.